that are joining. We're right at 9.30, do a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off with our foundation agenda and I start to see the wait room slow down. I'm Kendall Tyree, your executive director. Certainly wish I could be at an in-person annual conference with you today, but know this is the best alternative. And while we need to be efficient in our conversation and effective, we have a lot to cover in a short amount of time. We've taken three days worth of material and tried to pack it into a day of Zoom meetings. So if you can help us by introducing yourself and your name, organization, district in the chat box, if you haven't done so yet, we will be saving the chat box as well as recording this meeting to help with the meeting minutes and for those that weren't able to attend. I would ask that you try to stay on mute until you're ready to come off and speak or ask a question or present your report. It will help with the feedback. You've experienced a little bit of that since it happened in the office a moment ago. If you haven't, we've used it in the past. I also want to direct you right now to, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you'll see a bar pop up. If you click that participant button, you should have a bar pop up on the right side of your screen. And you should see a yes, no, go slower, go faster. We might be using those again today for voting purposes. Certainly some things can be yay, nay. And if there are nays and we need to record it or we think something is close, can head using that route. But know that option is there and we may be using that yes, no function in your participant box. If there are no questions, I'm gonna turn it over to President Richard Chafin and we will kick off today with our foundation agenda. You should have received an email from me yesterday afternoon if you'd registered in advance with a link to our agenda and all our materials on the website. We can certainly drop that in the chat box if necessary, putting in a link to our board meeting page or our virtual annual meeting page. Both of those pages have all the materials for today and our business meeting this afternoon. So if you're in need of any of the materials, let us know and staff will answer and reply and drop that link in the chat box for you. Otherwise, we'll follow up certainly after our meetings today and share that information, details and attachments. I will be screen sharing shortly all these materials too, but don't hesitate to stop us if you have any questions. There are no Zoom housekeeping issues. I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chapin. Well, good morning, everybody. We appreciate you taking time to, to join us for this uh, foundation board meeting. And again, as Kendall has said, I wish we could be in person. I always like to, to start with a word of prayer, if we might, to, to guide our activities. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather to do the business of your foundation and later on the business of our association. We just pray that you'll guide us in our efforts and, and, and guide us to do the things that we need to do to be good stewards of, of the gifts that you've given us. These things we do ask in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Again, we're, we're calling the business, the, the board meeting of the foundation to order today. Uh, are there any additions to the agenda that, uh, that you've received? Hearing none, uh, I trust that you have received uh, the foundation meeting minutes and have had a chance to review those. Are there any additions or corrections to the September foundation meeting minutes? Hearing none, they will be approved as distributed. Uh, John, good morning to you. If you would uh, like to make comments on the treasurer's report, we will appreciate it. Good morning and thank you. I think everybody has received from Kendall a copy of the treasurer's reports and also copies of individual reports that are prepared by more financial services for not only the foundation, but the Beals Fund and the Chafin Fund. Uh, and I'm pleased to report that I think our foundation is on extremely solid footing, thanks to the diligence of not just more financial, but Kendall and the staff. Let me start with the treasurer's report itself. There isn't much big change from the last report we had uh, three months ago, but I would like to point out some of the numbers that might cause some questions on the part of some people. If you'll take a look quickly at the uh, income side and the total restricted funds, you will see that we had budgeted $88,000 for this period, and we actually had $419,000 of income. 
Well, there are two things there that uh, uh, kind of make that happen that we didn't know about when the budget year started. One was the scholarship contribution from the Northern Neck uh, Soil and Water Conservation District. I believe that was in honor of J.C. Berger for $25,000. And then we have the NIFWIF grants for VCAP for $325,000. And when you subtract those from the $419,000 of income, you get right at about $93,000, which is close to the $88,000 that we had budgeted. We didn't have under the unrestricted funds, we didn't have any youth camp this year, unfortunately. So our, our income was uh, somewhat uh, down, but uh, you'll see that we still are, are very close to what we had budgeted. Same thing happened over on the disbursement side. If you'll take a look on the disbursement side, you'll see way down at the bottom, of course the NIFWIP grant is in there and also the $25,000 from the Northern Next uh, scholarships. But if you subtract the 325,000 down at the bottom on the total disbursements from the 458, you get 133,000, which is very close to what we had budgeted. So I think our foundation treasury is in extremely good shape. I would like to make a comment about the uh, things at the bottom of the page. You'll see that Kendall has shown our checking balance. She has shown the, shown the bills fund balance, the, the Chafin fund balance and the foundation investment balance. She also sent out a copies of the foundation reports. Uh, you, can't, I don't, you can't see what I'm holding up, I don't think, but the fact is you had these things there. Each of these reports is 10 or 12 pages. We do get together with more financial as needed and talk about these things. They go into great detail on each of the elements of the uh, funds, each of the things that are within those funds. And the more folks will tell us whether or not they think they're still appropriate or not appropriate. And as you can see, for the total foundation, uh, we're now at a total of $506,912.02, a half million dollars. And that's very close to the $502,000 that Kendall has shown down at the bottom of the treasurer's report. Now that's, the, the timing is what's causing that little difference there, but the more financial funds were I think dated the 3rd of, G uh, 3rd of December. And you'll see that the, uh, the uh, Chafin Fund is now at $108,619.30, and the Beals Fund is $133,820.18. So again, I would say, uh, President Chafin and members of the foundation, that thanks to the Moore Foundation and Kendall and her staff and the diligence both of them provide, I think our foundation is an extremely stable position. That concludes my report. John, thank you very much. Uh, and we appreciate all the work that you do uh, in conjunction with our finances. We, we appreciate everybody looking after things for us. Uh, are there any questions about the, the financial report or any of the financial information that you've received for the foundation from anybody? If not, uh, the, the report will be filed for audit. Uh, one last piece of business related to the finances, and that is um, the re-election of our assistant treasurer. We, Don Wells has been kind enough to serve in that position in the past. And uh, the, the board has agreed to recommend or the executive committee has agreed to recommend to the board that we reappoint Don to be the assistant treasurer uh, to, to assist as he may be necessary, as he may need to, since he's so close to the office. So the executive committee makes that in the form of a motion. Uh, is there a discussion? Hearing no discussion, all in favor of reappointing Don as uh, our assistant treasurer, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. The motion carries. Uh, thank you, Don. We appreciate you doing that. I'm glad to help. Thank you. I, 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 I'm, I caught myself, I'm very remiss this morning uh, when I, when I, opened our meeting with prayer. One of the things that I failed to do was to recognize uh, the, the loss of uh, 
of a tremendous individual that, uh, and we all are aware of it, but I, I should have particularly uh, mentioned it in this meeting and I sincerely apologize for not doing so, but you know, we, we've lost uh, a past president, we've lost uh, a past president, both of our foundation, as well as our association, but more importantly, we've lost a, a tremendous supporter and, and a dear friend. And uh, so as we go through this meeting and as we go through the coming days, we need to, to uh, continue to remember Wilkie and his family, uh, remember, remember them in our prayers and, and keep good thoughts about them for all, all that he meant to so many of us. I apologize for overlooking that important point. Is, is Ray with us this morning? Yes. Ray, are you here? He's connected. I am here. Well, it's good to have you with us, and we appreciate so much you taking time to be with us this morning, and welcome, and uh, we, we would like to hear any comments that you might have for, um, for the investments that we have with you. We're talking foundation now, but uh, later on, we'll be talking about the association. Okay. Uh, well, the report was well done uh, that you just gave. And interestingly, a few months back, we made a, a, a few changes to the portfolios. Uh, we added a couple of really almost what I would call brand new funds from ARC. Um, and in the uh, uh, Education Foundation, the ARC Genome Fund is up 47% in the last few months. And the ARC Innovation Fund is up 32%. And Dollar General, uh, since we bought it last year, is up 63%. So, I mean, it, it's it's been pretty amazing. And we have that in both the um, uh, both the Chafin and the Beals Fund as well. Um, so we, we're really, really pleased with the way those particular funds have done. You know, there's not much in the way of, of changes that we'd like to make. Uh, just note that on the, the 9th and 10th of October, uh, or 9th and 12th of October, we received uh, checks from Jackson National for the Beals Fund and for the um, uh, Education Foundation in the amount of about $7,770 for each one of them. Um, and so that money is sitting in cash and um, we have a pretty significant cash position in both of those funds as well as a significant bond portfolio in both of those funds. Um, so depending on anticipated expenditures out of um, the, uh, these funds, we would probably like to put that work, that money to work a little bit harder. But if we're gonna need cash, then certainly we don't wanna do that. You know, one thing that we need to keep in mind is that we're gonna, we're gonna have that $7,700 check coming in every, every year around October uh, for both of those funds. So that's cash that's gonna flow in uh, as long as JC is still with us, so. And hopefully that's going to be for all many years to come. So, um, speaking of Wilkie, you know, one of the things that we did last year was take the Chafin Fund away from Russell. And as soon as we did that, the performance just went pretty crazy, uh, jumping it um, all the way up to a hundred and what is it, one hundred and six thousand dollars, one hundred and eight thousand dollars now. So I mean, it's. Um, you know, an eighty-five thousand dollar investment. We've made distributions of three thousand uh, dollars twice, and another distribution of twenty-five hundred. Um, so we're we're very pleased with the way that that uh, fund has performed since we moved it from uh, from Russell. So now it's up to you guys. We're going to need money out of these funds, Kendall? Right, right. Thank you. Um, John and Kendall, uh, during our executive committee meeting, 
we spoke about possible needs, future needs, and that sort of thing. And and we felt like at that time that, that things were pretty well covered, that our cash situation was okay to cover our future needs. Has anything changed? I'll defer to Kendall, President Chafin, because I understand it the way you do. <laughs> and and Kendall is is saying we we things have not changed. So Ray, uh, I don't know if you have a particular recommendation at this point of what to do differently with with some of those investments. Uh, if you if you want to wait or if you have a recommendation now, we can act on them. But uh, we can also wait until a little bit later when we have an executive committee meeting. Well, I, I think what I'd like to do is I want, I want to keep some cash on hand just in case, obviously. Certainly. Uh, but the bond portfolios, they're, they're, they're just sitting there, basically. They're, they're generating 1% or 2% a year. And that's not going to change. Uh, the only way to change that is to go out in duration. And if we go out in duration, when interest rates go up, I guarantee you we're going to lose our shirts. So we, we don't want to do that. Um, I, if, I, be, I believe that what I I believe what I would like to see is if, if if the board is in agreement, I believe what I'd like to see is if you would if you would just give us some recommendations uh, in the in the in the uh, perspective time that we have today, if you would give us some recommendations and let us uh, let okay. us get back together as a group. I just like to reduce the bond positions and the cash positions a little bit. Um, and take those funds and increase our position in XLK, which is a technology ETF, and add a, uh, another ARC fund, and that's ARKW. Um, we are, uh, I believe that um, both of those will serve you very, very well. Would you would you do that? And, and I apologize, Ray. I think I was implying that we needed to to rush today, but uh, no, that's not a rush. That's what I'm recommending. Okay, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, no, no problem. Uh, are you recommending that for wherever we have those investments in the three funds? Yes, exactly correct. And okay. the, the the dollar amount is going to be very different between the funds because of the um, because the number of assets that, that they each have. Uh, so the Chafin Fund will be a pretty small investment in those. Um, and the, uh, uh, the Education Foundation will be more significant. But we're still going to leave a significant amount of cash or near cash just for emergency purposes. John, do you have any, uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? My only thoughts are we've had such good advice from the more financial folks before that uh, I, I would agree to do it if that's what he recommends. We need a motion to that effect. Would you like me to make that motion? If you will. I move that the Educational Foundation accept the more financial services recommendations for changes in the cash and bond funds throughout the uh, Beals, Chafin and Educational Foundation reports. Do we have a second to that motion? Don Wells, I'll I second, second that. Okay. Very good. Motion duly made and seconded. Is there any further discussion on that uh, recommendation? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Ray, thank you so much. You're welcome. Do you want me to hang around for the association meeting? Um, I think Kendall does want you to do that, if you will. Is there anything else for, for the foundation? No, sir. Thank you so much, as always, for your, for your guidance. Um, we move now to the, uh, to the reports and updates and so forth. Uh, we, we are in need of an education committee chair. Uh, I will... Uh, get together with Kendall and and we'll we'll talk about some people and delve into that a little bit more. If anybody has a 
an interest in that position. If anybody has a recommendation for that position, uh, we'd certainly like to hear from you. And um, with that, I'm going to ask Kendall if she will be kind enough to address any of the the activities that are going on between she and Bonnie and and uh, the folks here in the, on the team, I, I will appreciate it. Thank you so much, President Chafin. I know this afternoon you'll get a brief foundation activity report presentation also. I'll try to toss it up on the screen so you get a bit of a teaser. Our staff is working on foundation programming even in a virtual world. The slides that you have on your screen are ones what we'll be sharing later this afternoon during our membership meeting. Please don't forget about our annual report. We talked about this during our September board meeting. It is linked in the membership meeting this afternoon in the agenda. I encourage you to make sure you've taken a look. We'll be sending it still further to partners. I also want to bring up a few items and we're doing okay with time. So Bonnie, if you wanted to help tag team or make sure I don't leave anything out. Uh, Bonnie is working on a mock Envirothon. If you have not heard or have missed uh, the topic of Envirothon this year, the full Envirothon program will go virtual, including our local area and state competitions. So Bonnie has really done a lot of work to start transitioning to that format, uh, including the idea of a mock Envirothon in February's timeframe with districts that pull together a team of five folks, your directors, staff, but we really wanna be able to have a mock Envirothon with district teams, could include partners also, so we can test run the virtual format experience and ensure we work through any kinks that our students would be needing. Also know that Bonnie's been working on a kickoff for our Envirothon competition in a virtual world. We've thought about doing things a little bit different. And in early January, she's planning a Zoom meeting to help kick off and to release the oral presentation problem to introduce you to some of our sponsors like Dominion and the career paths that are available, as well as our foundation leadership. Bonnie, anything on Envirothon I've missed? Um, good morning, everyone. Um, just to echo what Kendall was saying, it's gonna be a virtual mock Envirothon in February. I'm gonna be sending out an email later this week all district. I really do encourage you to work with your districts to have a team. We'll have prizes for the top first place, second overall. And um, regarding the kickoff event in January, we're also gonna include some testimonials from past Envirothon participants so that they can share their experience and really show the impact that Envirothon has had on the students these past 20, almost 30 years in Virginia. Perfect. Questions about Envirothon for Bonnie? Bonnie, I'm so impressed with how we've pivoted this year also on other programs. I will save some of these slides for our business meeting this afternoon in terms of poster contest. On the screen now is actually last, oops, last year's Youth Conservation Leadership Institute participants. A great cohort wrapped up already and a new one has started. Bonnie, do you wanna talk about your efforts and how many Leadership Institute participants there are this year? Good morning, I guess. Um, so Youth Conservation Leadership Institute is in its sixth year. We have 23 participants this year um, representing eight soil and water districts. And we are also partnering with the Elizabeth River Foundation who are based in Portsmouth and working with two of their interns. So Leadership Institute is growing, which is fantastic. And if you don't know about Leadership Institute and would like to learn more, please reach out. Um, I know Mr. Peterson, Mr. Chafin all attended the award ceremony back in September, August. And I can't speak to how empowering Leadership Institute is to these students and how they get such great time. And I honestly can't speak highly enough about Leadership Institute. And I really wanna say thank you to all the districts that have been supportive in the past for, as mentors, and are working this year um, with the students. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Bonnie. Any questions for Bonnie? This afternoon, we'll also be announcing our award winners. To give a bit of a shout out right now, Bonnie works with our education committee to nominate and choose our teacher of the year winners. 
This year, our elementary teacher of the year is Laura Henry from Shenandoah Valley Soil and Water District. She's an elementary teacher. Her class serves as the recycling club. Once a week, students collect from other classes and older students assist younger children with the tasks. Students maintain recycling bins around the school with her assistance and our kindergarten students educate the student body about recycling do's and don'ts. Certainly we are excited to recognize Ms. Henry. A $250 check and certificate will be sent to Shenandoah Valley to help with Ms. Henry's recognition. In terms of our secondary teacher of the year, we are truly excited to announce Mr. Andrew Schmidt, nominated by Peter Francisco, folded to the top for recognition. Mr. Schmidt teaches welding at Buckingham County High School. He has been an Enviathon coach for five years and has coached his team to compete at the area and state levels. Due to his involvement with Enviathon, he's become passionate about exposing students to other environmental activities and topics. He's partnered with the district to organize an annual field trip, excuse me, to the Brock Environmental Center. He's a champion of youth conservation camp and has helped students not only apply, but has personally driven campers to Virginia Tech for the program. He responded to us saying he was honored, humbled, humbled and truly surprised for the honor. A $250 check and certificate will be sent to the district for us to help recognize him at the local level. I will save the Chafin Awards until this afternoon. We are truly excited about recognizing some of these individuals this afternoon. So please make sure you stay with us from 2 to 4.30 for our business meeting. I do wanna talk a little bit about fundraising. We have not been able to have any in-person fundraisers this year for the foundation. Our golf tournament was canceled and we did shift into planning for next year already. May 5th is the first Wednesday in May. We are gonna move forward with that effort. I hope you hold the date on your calendar and really look forward to bringing everybody back together for that event. It will be at the Hollows Golf Course again. I would be remiss if I don't take the chance every time we meet to talk about some foundation fundraising opportunities you can do on your own, such as the Kroger Community Rewards. If you have a Kroger in your area and shop and get your groceries at Kroger, connect your Community Rewards card with the foundation and they give a significant percentage of your purchase back to the foundation. Amazon Smile, I feel like Amazon is bringing more boxes to my doorstep every day in a pandemic. And I suspect as we head into the holiday season, it might be the same for you. I really encourage you to use Amazon Smile to purchase your gifts and support the Education Foundation. It is a win-win for you and our Education Foundation. There are links in your agenda for both of those programs if needed. The annual meeting. Unfortunately, we're not at the Hotel Roanoke right now and I can't push you for a raffle ticket. However, I'm still gonna try to get a little bit in. Shannon just texted me and said, why don't you wait until around 11.30 to talk about raffles and instead encourage folks to maybe try to buy if they haven't. There are still some raffle tickets coming in for sales. You saw it via All District. It is on our website on the annual meeting webpage. Go purchase a raffle ticket. At this time, we have over $4,600 in raffle sales. Uh, in a virtual world, that's a success for us. And I thank each of you for making contributions to the foundation. We will be drawing numbers at the end of our virtual quarterly business meeting, quarterly board meeting, excuse me, closer to 11.30, 12.30 when we wrap up today. So Shannon has a little bit more time to drop all those names into our spreadsheet. Uh, so stay tuned. Five of you will have to give me a number between one and something before our meeting wraps up. For the winners of a Graves Mountain package, thank you, Lynn Graves, for putting that forward. A Hotel Roanoke package, a Yeti cooler, thanks to a donation from Loudoun Soil and Water District, a steel backpack blower that we received from James River Equipment, and a barn quilt, thanks to Blue Ridge Soil and Water District. So five great prizes we'll draw at the end of uh, today's business meeting. I'm going to stop there, President Chapin, unless you have any questions on activity reports and toss it back to you for questions or nominating committee. Any, any questions of Kendall on any of these things that have been discussed? I'd just like to, to continue to offer my, uh, my thanks and my my uh, praise, if you will, for uh, for the work that that Kendall, Bonnie, and the whole office team has done to 
maintain some semblance of normality uh, and, and generate income for our foundation, for your foundation during these difficult times. I just can't, uh, can't say enough about the efforts that they've done uh, and, and maintaining our relationship with the young people through the Envirothon and the Youth Conservation Leadership Institute. These are, these are important relationships that we, we don't want to don't want to lose contact with. So thank you all very much. Um, John, if you would be kind enough to give us uh, a nominating committee report, we would appreciate that. Back in August, uh, Presidents France from the State Association and Chafin from the Educational Foundation asked Joan Commoner, who is a director of Lord Fairfax Conservation District, Gary Boring, Director of New River and myself, if we would serve as a nominated committee, we also we all agreed. And then Gary and Joan asked if I would serve as a chair. So that's how I got this job. Uh, the state, the Educational Foundation, will elect the following officers today: the president for a one-year term, the vice president for a one-year term, and the secretary treasurer for a one-year term. Following are the nominating committee recommendations for Educational Foundation officers for the position of President Richard Chafin from Peaks of Otter, SWCD, for the position of Vice President. And we all are saddened by the loss of Wilkie uh, Chafin, uh, but I'm really grateful that Jim Gelson from Prince William stepped up and volunteered to be nominated. So for the position of Vice President, Jim Gelson from the Prince William Salt and Water Conservation District, and for the position of uh, Secretary Treasurer, myself, John Peterson from the Northern Virginia Salt and Water Conservation District. The work of the nominating committee is now concluded and we appreciate having the opportunity to serve you in this way. Do I hear a motion for the closing uh, of the nominations and, uh, and, and election by acclamation? Mr. Chair, I so move. have a motion and a second. Um, all, a minute. This is John. Uh, Thank you. My motion was Gary Boring. My second will be done well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All in favor of the recommendation signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. All right. Are there, uh, I have no particular new business to come before the foundation at this point. If anybody else does, or if there are any uh, comments that anyone would like to make with regard to the foundation. Hearing none, we appreciate your taking time to attend. We will uh, schedule an executive committee meeting before too long, but uh, in the meantime, uh, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much, President Chafin. At this time, we'll adjourn the foundation, but shift to the association. If you had the email or on our website, the back of your foundation agenda is our association agenda. President France, if you'll kick us off. All right, Ty. Hi. So this is Janina. Sorry, I stepped in a little bit late. I never anticipated that it actually be snowing uh, when I came down today. So that was. That was pretty interesting and just reaffirms that people can't drive in the snow or snow flurries. <laughs> so uh, so anyway, so I, I'm happy to see you guys. So I'll call the meeting to order and I'm actually going to ask um, Mr. Chapin if he could do our invocation for us, please. Well, once again, Father, we come to you and we, we ask, for, ask for your guidance for this association, just as we did for our foundation and and again, uh, uh, Paul, we, we lift up the, the Chapin family to you for, for remembering Wilkie and, and all that he contributed, again, not only to the foundation, but also to the, to the association. He was a leader there as he was throughout his, his own district and, and throughout everything that we do. Uh, and uh, again, Paul, we come to you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. President France, instead of a round table introductions like we normally do, I've seen a lot of folks connect late. If you can ensure you've dropped your name and district affiliation into the chat box, we'll be saving the chat box and recording this meeting for help with the minutes. 
we'll capture introductions that way. All right, so if you haven't put your name in the chat box, please do that. Um, and again, just a reminder that uh, for voting purposes, um, only directors can vote uh, as we move through the agenda. Uh, also, I just want to welcome uh, some of our other board members. I see Lynn Graves is on, that he's our first vice president uh, from Culpeper District. Wayne Davis is here in the room. He's our second vice president from Colonial. And then I saw Don somewhere, um, and he is our secretary treasurer from Hanover, Caroline. So um, thank you all for joining today. And I don't, I think that we'll just leave it at that for board members and guests. Um, just, we have 55 participants today. So uh, if that's an indication of where we are this afternoon, it's gonna be really interesting. So um, again, bear with us as we move through this morning's agenda, as well as this afternoon's business meeting. Um, feel free to drop um, questions or comments in the chat box. I'm going to reiterate some of what Kendall talked about. We've got our staff monitoring the chat. And so we will try to make sure that we get everybody. Again, and then for those that haven't attended our previous area, um, either area meetings or um, meetings that we held last week uh, prior to this, we'll go over really quickly again um, how to cast your vote um, for motions that may come up during today's um, morning meeting as well as this afternoon's business meeting. So everyone should be able to see that at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is an icon for participants. And you'll see we have 56 uh, participants on right now. If you click on that, it should pull up a list of names. Your name is on that list. Um, and so when we go to ask um, for voting for a motion, if you agree, you just click yes. If you disagree, you click no. Um, and so what we'll do here is we'll just practice. All those who understand what I've just said, please signify by saying I, those that don't, click no. And we'll just practice. And so what we should see here is a bunch of little check boxes. And then I'm just gonna uh, pause for a minute and see how we do, and then ask for questions. President France, I do see a few no's coming in. I would remind our folks that are voting, certainly everyone can test this out at the moment. The board is comprised of our area chairs and our executive board. So if you are on the association board as an area chair or our officer team, you, are have, voting, you have voting privileges this morning. So I see some of you testing it out and clicking no who are not members of the association board, which is perfectly fine. I want you to play with this also as we may use it at our business meeting this afternoon, but keep that clarification Janina shared this afternoon in mind. Steven, do you have any questions about this feature? No, I'm just practicing saying no. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. I hope that's also not an indication of this morning <laughs> and this never, afternoon. Never know. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. We've had we've had some very good discussions in previous area meetings and, and last week as well as um, our prep for this coming meeting. So um, I'm feeling pretty confident that we'll be able to navigate this. Um, I'm not sure I'm in the right place. I see like um, the Brady Bunch with everybody on there and nothing to press saying no. Am I missing a link to something or is there some different view I'm supposed to take? So Frida, um, we're going over how you click on the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then when you uh, pull that up at the bottom of the participants uh, box, you'll see a green yes and a red no button. And it's just clicking on one of those. Got it? All right. Thanks, Frida. Perfect. Perfect. Certainly for things that might be close, we'll be using this yes, no feature for voting 
as you saw in the foundation, we might just need to do an up, down, yes, no vote and then see where we need to stand if using this as an option. I don't know if it is the case this morning, but I will mention it no less. If there are multiple of you sitting in a room and there are two directors in a district office right now, I suspect that will be the case this afternoon. If you can just help by writing in the chat box two yes and verifying your directors and letting us know, there's a bit of an honor code system here too, but our staff is monitoring the chat box in addition to that yes, no feature, just in case we need to capture some additional votes. Okay. All right, so if there aren't any questions, um, well, and hopefully we check the chat to make sure that we don't have any questions. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move into the agenda. So uh, first up on the agenda is the approval of our September 2020 association meeting minutes. Um, there are, as we go through here, just a reminder through your agenda, there are links to these documents um, for you for easy access electronically. Um, so if you want to reference them prior to a vote, please feel free to do so. So again, we are um, reviewing the September 2020 association meeting minutes, um, and we are looking for um, approval of the minutes. When everybody speak up at one time. Please state your name also when you do make a motion that will help as we capture minutes. This is John Peterson, Northern Virginia. I move the minutes be approved as presented. Lynn Graves. Right, I heard Lynn and Don fighting over it. We'll put one of you down in the notes. Give it to Lynn. <laughs> All right, we have a first. Uh, from John Peterson and a second from Lynn Graves. So we'll open up for any discussion on those meeting minutes. Rick Shufflett, this is a uh, minor, but my name has only got one T in it. I do that all the I'm time. I'm so sorry, sir. That's all right. I'm a short Shufflett. <laughs> Thank you for keeping me straight. You're on. All right. Anybody else? All right. So, all right. Here we go. All those in favor of approving the September 2020 Association meeting minutes as amended to fix Rick's name, <laughs> um, check yes in your participants box. All those nay, check no. And again, voting membership is limited to the board and the area chairs for this particular meeting. Okay, I see no, no vote. So well, motion is carried. Thank you all very much for that. Um, all right, so we're gonna move on to the review and approval of the treasurer's reports. And I believe Don is on to help us with that. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, we have three different uh, items here. We have the FY uh, 2020 report, which uh, closed the fiscal year on June 30th. And then we have the expenditures to date for the current fiscal year and a proposed budget for uh, FY 22. And I will after going over it and asking for questions, uh, I'll make a motion to cover all three items. The first one, uh, the income in FY20 was 447857 And expenditures total for, for the year, and we did go over these in September. And the total expenditures were $415,750.16. Uh, any questions on the first fiscal year? All right, moving to the current year, I think we're in, have been in good shape. Our expenditures have been down. Uh, for the first half, uh, for the last half of the last fiscal year, and uh, currently through uh, 
through today because we've had minimum expenditures for travel. And uh, our income to date is $398,027. And We've got a different figure from a report that I have. Is that 302, the total? No, that's expenses. Go back up to the income. Kendall, can you go back up to the income? You should be seeing it on your screen now. I would not. Yeah, total income $398,027.69. Uh, and I would compliment all 47 districts for paying their support service fees. Our expenditures uh, to date were $302,101. And I would note that. Now, cash balance in the checking account on 12 1 was $307,639. Our investment balance was $189,934. And our pipeline investment was $3,548,000. Um, we have made some expenditures out of the pipeline funds. We've had uh, at least two of the four districts have uh, submitted their plans. They've approved it, and we uh, advanced them the 8% technical assistance. John, I can clarify that. You're right. Uh, Since we've met, all four have now submitted their signed grant agreement with the association, and the 8% has been provided. Okay. I, I knew there were two. I wasn't positive about the other two, but... That's good uh, news. And on our budget, our budget uh, for the coming fiscal year tracks pretty well with the uh, a budget for the current year and in the past two years. So uh, I would move that we receive and file for audit the report for FY20 that we receive the uh, budget information for, for to date for the uh, current fiscal year and that we approve the budget for the current year, for the coming year. So I can tell you that in September, you did approve column five, the fiscal year 22 budget as a proposal so this afternoon, the full membership would need to vote on it. I left it there just as a FYI, but, but you did take action on column five as a recommendation to move to the full membership in September. So because there are no changes, we're just gonna move to that, okay. okay. All right. So Don, you just, uh, did you wanna repeat your motion for us? My motion is to receive and file for audit the FY20 budget information, receive the FY, uh, current FY21 budget information, and approve the budget for FY22. Okay. This, <clears throat> this is Daphne Jamison. I'd like to second the motion. Thank you, Daphne. That last one should be recommend approval at the business meeting this afternoon. Got it. All right. We have a first from the motion from Don and a second from Daphne. Does anybody have any uh, questions? We'll open it for discussion. All right. Sorry. We're just having a little bit of a, a short discussion. Okay, so all right, all those in favor of receiving and filing for audit the FY21 um, 
actual, the FY21, uh, and what is the FY21 for the future, right? I'm sorry, I was answering questions. That yeah, was... that's okay. The actual, the FY21 actual, the FY21 expense, and then moving forward for recommendation, the FY22 budget as proposed, signified by saying I by checking yes or nay by checking no. All right, I have 10 yeas and I mean, 10 yeas and no no's, so motion is carried. Thank you, Don. Um, for that, did you want to move into the other two bullets, Don? All right. Well, well, I can help with that if necessary. One is just an FYI, much like the foundation, we're working with our CPA, Everett Wynn, to finalize needs with our taxes. And the last item, I believe we still have Ray Moore on the line, if we can have an update on our investments. And those reports are posted on our website and I will screen share as much as possible. Ray, are you still with us? I am here. Thank you. Floor is yours. All right. Well, the pipeline account is the pipeline account. It's basically sitting in, in cash or near cash. Um, we're not making any money with it, but we can't afford to lose a penny. So it's um, uh, it's it's all in U.S. Treasuries, uh, very very short term U.S. Treasuries. The uh, the foundation account, however, um, again we we switched from Russell um, last uh, or earlier this year. Since making the switch from Russell, um, the portfolio has performed extremely well. Um, in fact, uh, uh, our year-to-date return um, is has jumped significantly from what it has historically been to about almost seven percent, and next year we should see that jump dramatically. Um, we are still keeping that fairly conservative um, with a. Uh, 40, 47 percent uh, position in, in cash and bonds. Um, this is uh, this is your emergency fund. Um, so I'm not going to recommend any changes at this point since we uh, totally reallocated everything back in uh, back in September. Questions for Ray? Ray, did, were you going to recommend any changes or no, we're good? No, no. Uh, we, we, we need to keep this account conservative, I believe. Okay. Uh, more conservative than we keep the other accounts because this is your emergency fund. Yep. Um, so we're just, uh, I, I, we did total reallocations in, in September of last year or this year. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah, there's no, no activity, nothing that I recommend. Great. All right. Any does anyone have any questions for Ray? Uh, I only have one question for you guys. Sure. Uh, so when do we expect to? We've got uh, two hundred three three hundred fifty five thousand dollars in uh, in money market still in the account, uh, which obviously we can get our hands on at any time. But you know, the basically three and a three and a half million is. Uh, is sitting in in treasuries. When are we going to need to start tapping that money so we can make sure we have it available? Let Kendall kind of talk about that. Certainly. So we've expensed the eight percent TA already to districts. I certainly know within the next few months there could be some project completion. I will certainly start doing a little bit more sleuthing with folks like Daphne and Blue Ridge to understand where their momentum is. And when we think project completion would come through, it's honestly a little bit of a race with our districts to figure out and understand the momentum they will have. And I throw Daphne Jameson under the spotlight a little bit because Blue Ridge is our pipeline district that is moving the fastest at this point with those funds. 
So certainly something I need to understand a bit more in terms of how much project completion will come through and we'll certainly follow up with you. Unless Daphne, you have anything to add that might help shed light on it now. Well, I can't speak to when, when they might be complete, but I think at our board meeting uh, at the end of November, we approved uh, something like $800,000 uh, worth of projects. I had wondered so that's how about half of our allocation, I think. That's perfect. I had wondered how much had been approved and knew you were the first one to bring up approval. So thank you all. Uh, continue to work so with you. We've, we've got Michael and Alan working really hard. Perfect. I do also so, want to go ahead, Ray. I'm sorry. So if that if, the, if those projects have been approved, how long before? I guess you won't need the money until they're completed. That's correct. Right. Not, yeah, not until the project is completed and spot checked by our staff would we pay out on the practice to the farmer. So, so about <clears throat> what, what do you anticipate completion dates to be, Daphne? Well, I don't really, I don't have that information today. Uh, this was a surprise meeting for me <laughs> uh, to, to fill in for Ruth Pierce. So I didn't have all my ducks in a row, but I think they, by, by law, they have to do it within they have to start on it like within 90 days. Is that right, Kendall? That's correct. If they're following the VAX manual, that's correct. Yeah, they have to start on it within 90 days. And, and then, you know, there can be extensions if they're extenuating circumstances like weather. And there always are. So, uh, but, but we've, got them, we've got them approved. And some of them are simpler than others. So, uh, you know, some of them can get going right away. Ray, I'll certainly spend some time digging into that a little bit more and touch base with you. All right, thank you. I do want to recognize that Frida put a comment in the box about the $2 million of fines from the Mountain Valley pipeline violations. And I don't know if Kendall has more information about where that money actually goes. I don't know where the fines come from, but I do want to clarify, none of this money when we talk about pipeline is fines or anything related to that. That money goes to the EQ for determination. This is money that before even conversations started, the Commonwealth entered into an agreement for uh, mitigation. I use that loosely because mm -hmm. the pipeline company wanted to put funding in the area where the pipeline would come through to help improve efforts as construction was had. So none of this is fines from these dollars. Frida, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I know. I know when we were reviewing the monies, there was like the original mitigation money, and then it looked like it, there was additional funds coming from two other sources that were added to our budget. So that's why I was wondering if that was coming from those violations, or was that just money coming from the state and federal government that was separate from that? I think I can answer that too. The association originally took this money from the Commonwealth, and eight percent technical assistance was provided. We recognize with our districts that 8% is not enough in terms of technical assistance. So we waited for a number of reasons to put those dollars on the ground. And in that time period, we sought an additional grant from the Virginia Environmental Endowment to help raise that technical assistance amount to those four impacted districts. So the additional dollars that we're putting towards pipeline are not any affiliation with the original pipeline funds or not, it's grant funding to help increased technical assistance to the district to get those dollars on the ground. Does that clear that up a little bit, Frida? Okay, all right, great, thank you. I see your thumbs up. All right, any more questions? Ray, you have anything else? If not, and we can, we can let you go back to the tropics. Oh boy, I get to go swimming now. <laughs> In the snow. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Ray, for being with us for both the foundation meeting yep. this morning as well as um, our meeting now. And will you be? Will he be here this time? Okay. So we will not see you this afternoon. Um, nope. But thank you. Always miss seeing you in person. I hope you get a lot of people buying tickets. And I'm, I hope I'm, so. We'll, really, we'll, we'll have another push for that here soon. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Ray. All right. Bye bye. All right, everyone. So we're going to move right now into uh, brief area reports and updates and area meeting information. Um, at our meeting last week, um, we were able to get a more detailed discussion of uh, how things went at the area 
um, business meetings. This is basically our, our effort to recap and bring to light any uh, specific information that needs to be addressed related to items that might need to go to the business meeting this afternoon. So we'll just um, walk down this list. So we'll start with area one. And Rick, are you giving that report? Well, I haven't heard Kevin say anything, so apparently I am. <laughs> uh, we tried to do a one-page uh, update of our area one meeting, and, and hopefully each person here can read those things. I wasn't planning on reading them, but as you go down, each district reported and have uh, some specifics that they wanted to know at, at our meeting. Um, overall, districts are well. The staffing is good. Uh, they've all dealt with virtual everything, and I think, uh, especially from our standpoint at Headwaters, uh, we feel like our technicians are getting a lot of work done, even though they're away from the office. And uh, hey, it looks like a new normal uh, for a while, uh, but they're dealing with it very well. Uh, new staffing is interesting, trying to train and get those people out on jobs uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, but it's going okay too. Uh, from the headwater standpoint, uh, in going over our strategic planning, that last bullet you've got there, uh, the uh, input we had from uh, our client surveys was really good. And um, we are gonna pass some of those things on uh, as far as uh, what the complaints are at probably uh, later today at our business meeting. I'll take any questions. Doesn't mean I'm going to answer them, but I'll take them. Oh, thanks, Rick. Anybody have any questions for Rick on the area one information? Okay, moving on to area two, Jim. Gelson. Yeah. Hello, Kendall and all. Um, or I'm sorry, Gianna. Um, we elected uh, a new area chairman, John Flannery from Loudoun County, and a new vice chair, Will Lintner from Prince William. So area two will be in good hands for the next two years. I have a lot of confidence in them. Uh, we've got a tentative spring meeting location and date, but I will leave that up to John and see what he wants to do with it. Cause um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, with a COVID thing in the mix, there's um, thing, things will, uh, he'll have to gauge that as time goes on a little bit. Um, the big thing from our area two meeting was the healthy souls initiative. And um, area two would like to get that back on the legislative agenda. I sent out an email this morning actually in, uh, in advance for our afternoon meeting, uh, I got some talking points from Ricky Rash and from Kendall as well, so that uh, we can digest that a little bit. Um, the big holdup on that is that the uh, the legislators are meeting uh, electronically, and it's going to be hard to uh, to get anything to uh, to put on the floor. Mm -hmm. The uh, legislators also have a limit as to how many bills they can introduce, so. Um, We'll be discussing that more later on. And then um, let's see, we've got the discrimination policy going forth. So um, I, I understand that several of the area, other areas have uh, added to that, but um, it doesn't have to be cast in stone right now. I'd like to get it on with the uh, amendments that um, the other areas have put on uh, because it'll be reviewed next year in any case. But uh, those are the highlights from area two. All right, thank you, Jim. And uh, we look forward to the discussion in a little bit on um, the soil and health program. All right, so area three. Unfortunately, Frank was having some technical difficulties. I don't know that he was able to join us. Yes, don't... I'm here. I'm here. Hey, hey, Frank. Okay, you would like to give us the your report for area three, please? Okay, sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. This will be this will be very brief. But once again, I want to thank Kathy Shamblin for her efforts. She um, has really put forth an extra effort to get this document accomplished. And you can read this 
um, you know, on your own time. But what I will speak to is the the theme that kind of emerged about uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion opportunities that we have. You know, our employee association had a committee on that, and they put a lot of work in on that plan, uh, otherwise referred to as the DEI committee. And let's see. Okay. Will Lintner, I see your message. I hope you can hear me a little more clearly. But uh, regardless, talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, you know, if, you're di if a district is undergoing a strategic plan, uh, that can be an opportunity to include some specific goals or efforts around implementing the suggestions from the an employee association's DEI plan, diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. And then the final thing that I will say, uh, we recently, the Northern Neck District, we recently did our performance evaluations of our employees. And so just want to share the idea and, and to encourage other directors or those involved with performance evaluations of employees, that can be a great time to, to foster and nurture a conversation, uh, a, a, an upfront conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion okay. initiatives. So I just will give one example. And, you know, we were able to, during the performance evaluations, we were able to ask each employee about their thoughts on that and their efforts and how they could envision uh, our district at least or any ideas uh, about improving our diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one thing that emerged was we have some staff members who have a background in emergency services and they have certain certifications. They serve on the fire squads and rescue squads and fire, fire uh, personnel. So that puts them in touch with the people in the community they know the people in the community, they know where they are, and they have a certain comfort level uh, of engaging different communities. So sometimes if we look at the talents and existing strengths in our staffs and in our employees, you may find a lot of solutions and opportunities there. Other than that, um, that's all that I will reflect. And uh, as you read through the report, I welcome any questions either today or, or as time emerges and thank you so much. All right, thank you, Frank. Does anyone have any questions uh, for Frank about you know anything about the Area 3? I believe that Area 3 report is also linked for you. Um, all right, we're gonna move on to Area 4. Gary, do we have you? I saw you. Oh, there you are, Gary. I'm here. And I was gonna ask Kendall, did you get our text report? Yeah, good, so I don't have to read all this stuff and y'all don't have to listen to me struggle with. It. Uh, as you can see, most of our districts are seeking funding from other sources um, like TMDL funding and pipeline funding, different things to achieve their goals of putting conservation on the ground. I think we have six districts with TMDL projects and a couple more that are applying for the next cycle. So that really pleases me to see that. We also got trying to get some educational things going with, with um, doing a virtual kids in the woods program from Big Sandy. Um, we have a, an environmental education video, Clinch Valley. Um, there's one other one, there's a, a, basically a trailer, educational trailer being put together for use. So those are some of the highlights that's going on out here. Uh, we're just, all the districts have pretty well established the routine for working through the COVID programs and everything. So their COVID restraints, um, we're just looking forward to getting back to a more normal year next year. Hopefully with the, the vaccines coming on, we'll be able to move back to a more normal operating procedure. They're all, all the districts are keeping up with their cost share expenditures, uh, getting their funds and doing real well. <laughs> and I'll try to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you, Gary. 
Anyone have any questions for Gary for area four? Okay, we'll move on to area five. Um, again, unfortunately, um, due to the passing of Wilkie, we have some else to step in and, and give us a report for area five. And um, looks like Daphne has been tagged for giving an area five report. So Daphne, do you have yeah, something for us? It, it should have been Bruce Pierce uh, because he's the vice chair, but at our area five meeting, Bruce and I were elected uh, co-chairs for um, uh, for the area upcoming. And then last night, Bruce called me and said that he had an emergency to come up with a doctor's appointment. He couldn't come today, so I'm it. Um, uh, you have a lengthy report that Bruce has compiled. It's 13 pages long, and I'm certainly not going to read that to you, but it contains a wealth of information. Um, we have 10 districts in Area 5, and uh, I think that uh, Bruce and his staff did an admirable job getting all of this together. Um, I can speak uh, in a little bit of a general way about Blue Ridge, which is where I am. Uh, we, by a stroke of luck, we had uh, earlier uh, this in 2020, we moved into a new rental space for our district which is much larger than what we had before. And uh, it also has separate offices so that everybody's not piled on top of one another. And we were not directly in contact with NRCS, which we were before. Uh, and this really was a good time for that move, looking back on it, because even though we did, uh, when, when first the lockdown came, we, uh, we worked, you know, uh, not, not at the office except for one person at a time, we decided that we could do better than that because of the space that we had in there. And so everybody went back to work at their space uh, after about two months. And we have been working really, really hard since then. So uh, we've gotten a lot done as you can see. Uh, and I know that there's been a lot of communication between our district and the other districts in the area, uh, plus, you know, uh, with Skyline and the ones uh, who got the Mountain Valley Pipeline funds. Uh, and that's been, you know, a godsend for us because we've gotten a lot more uh, projects that are, uh, that, that we're working on. Uh, I'm, I cannot answer any questions about all these others because actually I just saw this report this morning and I wasn't able to absorb all 13 pages into my, into my brain. So uh, please take a look at it at your leisure. Uh, I think that it shows that everybody is working very hard and doing a great job uh, under, under the circumstances that we've had in 2020. And we've learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you, Daphne. I asked if anybody had any questions to let you know, but I think they should just review the report. It is a very <laughs> comprehensive report, I have to say. I'm, I'm quite impressed and please extend our, uh, our appreciation to Bruce for compiling such a great example of oh, what yeah, that's the report I, looks like. <laughs> All right. All right, so we'll just... Uh, Move on to the area sure, six report. Go. And I think that Granville is going to give us a report. Is that right, Granville? That's correct. I'll keep it short and sweet. You have the report, area six report in front of you. Um, we are still in area six. A lot of the districts are still looking for additional funds, if available, from other districts of the state on for carrying out cover crop and our, our programs and we've come up way short but we had a large sign up uh, as you see 800,000 and I think we had a little over 300,000 um, in funds we would like to seek more money to help we're getting a lot of new people and we would like to continue to do so and that's about it uh, as you can see the report is there and I don't need to be reading or uh, taking up any more time. Thank you, Granville. Anybody have any questions? 
All right, thank you everybody for your, your brief area reports. Again, I was fortunate enough due to uh, the current situation of the pandemic to uh, virtually attend all the area meetings. Um, so it was great to, to see folks online and participating. And again, I'll, I'll commend everybody for being flexible and um, trying to work through these challenging times um, and getting all the districts um, into a place where we can have uh, these types of meetings, at least for the near future. All right, so we're gonna move into the standing committee plans and reports. And so we have a, a couple of folks tapped for these reports and we'll start with our marketing and public relations committee. And do we have Lisa Hyde on the line with us today? Yep, I'm here, hello. Hi, Lisa, could you give us a report on the marketing sure. and public relations committee, please? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, just a little brief update for the marketing committee. Um, we will be hosting our next marketing committee meeting on January 5th at 1 p.m. Um, via Zoom. If anyone would like to join us for that meeting, um, please please do let myself or, uh, or Shannon or Kendall know if you'd like to be added to the email list. We always welcome uh, new folks to join us for that meeting. In that meeting, we'll be discussing our um, upcoming marketing training that's gonna be taking place on January 13th at 10 a.m. Um, as part of the annual meeting um, training blitz that's been going on for some time with various trainings. Um, this will be the, the marketing portion on January 13th. Um, that marketing training will be going through uh, and teaching everyone about the marketing toolkit, which is what you're seeing on your screen right now. This is the the big task that the marketing committee has been working on, um, I think you'll recall I've been talking about it for some time. Um, we are ready to launch the marketing toolkit. Um, this marketing toolkit is gonna be filled with, as you can see, all sorts of links and templates and how to's and all sorts of good stuff for districts uh, to start uh, working on their online outreach strategies. Um, everything from making videos to taking good pictures to creating flyers and new websites, all, all that good stuff that um, we've been hearing from a lot of districts that they're in need of this type of information. So the training on January 13th will be going through this toolkit, teaching everyone how to use it, what types of resources are available on it. And then after that training, um, this marketing toolkit will be going live on the association's website um, in, in the format you're seeing right now. It'll be a PDF with, there'll be hot links. So if you see all the blue links there that are underlined, yep, folks can just uh, hover on those and click on them and they'll take them to either the tutorials or the websites or the templates or what have you. So we're really, really excited to see this finally um, getting out there to help everybody. Certainly during this time where everyone's working remotely, um, we've been hearing more, more than ever that everyone's really needing some resources on these types of materials. So we're really happy to finally be getting it out there. So um, we, hope, we hope a lot of folks will join us for the training. Again, it's January 13th at 10 a.m. And just keep an eye out in those um, training blitz emails that Kendall's been sending out. Um, there'll be information about joining um, that that training at a at our later date, and that's all I have. Thank you. This really big thanks to Lisa. I don't know if folks realize how much work she's really done to keep our marketing committee moving forward. It has been a, a lot on her plate, and I really am appreciative, Lisa. And in addition to what she's noted just here, again, register for that January thirteenth, just like you did for today on our website. Uh, we are working with Lisa and Bonnie and. Some of some district staff to really try to also add to the training blitz a video making workshop. Uh, so stay tuned for hopefully details in the next few weeks of that coming in February, maybe a three part effort. So I'll leave that as a teaser and really thank you, Lisa. I don't know if folks really realize how much you've given us, and I'm very thankful. You're very welcome, Kendall. It's it's been a lot of fun. I'm I'm really enjoying getting to be a part of this. So thank you. Yeah, it's absolutely fabulous. I mean, and I'm excited about it. The timing is just perfect for us. I mean, I'm, you know, it's a fortunate, but unfortunately kind of thing, but this is, um, this is really great. Even, even, you know, just this PDF, um, it's done really well. 
So uh, I thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Lisa? I hope everybody can encourage your staff or uh, you know yourself to attend. I think there's some really good information here and might help you understand what some of your staff is, is working on to try to uh, keep things moving in a virtual environment. All right, no questions. We'll move on to our next report. So our next report is coming from the um, Admin and Ops Committee. And uh, Susie Brown is our chair of that committee. Good morning. Um, this year, the committee was really busy. Um, we've had a lot of meetings related to um, COVID procedures and helping keep districts you know, going forward um, in this unprecedented time you know, with so many people teleworking. We've uh, tried to have guest speakers. We've had people from the Library of Virginia. Uh, Terry Higgins has did several calls with us, but the calls have really provided a great outlet for districts to share with each other about the way they're handling operations during this time. Um, so I think there's been a lot of value. I know there's been a lot of people on each call. I think we've averaged like 35 to 40 on each call. Um, and it's not only staff, we've actually had directors participating also. Um, Terry Higgins did a training uh, session on personnel uh, in October that was really well attended. Um, Terry always does a tremendous job sharing information related to personnel. Um, the committee will meet, probably have our first meeting late January, early February um, to start looking at this year and see what the needs are. But we do plan to continue to have these um, conference calls for districts just to touch base with each other and share their ideas and uh, things they're learning during this time. Susie, a big thank you. I know the <clears throat> operations committee work that I've been a part with you has shifted and focused so much on COVID efforts this year and had a lot of great interest. I will add a topic that is really admin operations focused is Freedom of Information Act. And on December 15th, there is a FOIA training as part of our training blitz. You should see on your screen our website. So ensure you register for this one too. If you need this for meeting Code of Virginia training requirements, this session is for you also. Okay. okay. And I'll touch on the other topics in just a bit. Susie, a huge thank you for the leadership you do on this. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Um, does everybody have any questions for Susie? That's the same website where you can find the link for the marketing uh, mm -hmm. training that's also coming up. And please register ahead of time for that um, so you can get the information. All right, Don, we got your message. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move on to our legislative committee report. And we are fortunate today to have Ricky Rash with us in the room. And so we're going to let him take over. Um, and give us a, his committee report. Good morning, everyone. I got fussed out at the Area 5 meeting if my voice wasn't projecting. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, I'd like to just start out with a little housekeeping. I've had a couple of calls this fall from a couple of directors. Uh, good friends of mine said that they weren't getting the legislative uh, agendas out in time. So for your area chairs, you uh, administrative uh, uh, people on the phone at district level, uh, district chairman, even area chairs, just remind them that the process starts early on as a grassroots. Uh, it can come from an individual through a district, through the area preferably. Area two normally does a vast majority of the heavy lifting on the um, legislative report force, but other areas also contribute. Um, not sure whether the information is not getting shared. I know it goes out from the association office, uh, either from Don or Kendall. Um, so I, I know it's going out because I receive them. It's just a question of checking your email a little more closely, I think. But uh, if you have suggestions, if you need to see my name on it specifically, so you'll know to look at it a little more closely, uh, just let us know. I, I'm, I've had this question before in years past. I'm just still stumped on how to correct it, but 
the, the last thing I want to bring up before I get into the report is if you want to be on the legislative committee, all you have to do is respond, ask, and you will be included, uh, whether it's a virtual meeting or face-to-face -face meeting. And uh, generally in the fall, in the August timeframe before the fall uh, association board meeting, we look at all of the legislative proposals and come up with an um, come up with a, an agenda and present it to the board, and then the board can accept or reject um, the items at their September board meeting. So with that, you have the report that your board accepted and is moving forward for the meeting this afternoon. Um, very short and sweet, um, maintaining operation, uh, district operation funds. We don't want to lose any money in a, in a budget year, especially with the chokehold that COVID has on us. Um, establish, um, stable resources in the uh, surplus money is the, the WQIF and the Virginia Natural Resources Commitment Fund are separated. Um, once the money goes into the commitment fund, they are locked for non-point source. If they remain in the WQIF, the Secretary of Natural Resources has the ability to um, shift those funds between point source and non-point source. Uh, within the code, but the code is actually uh, the commitment fund is in code that they have to remain for point source. Uh, VCAP been a very, very successful program. Um, we've asked for more money in the past. We're asking for two million this year. It is an increase, but we're at 500,000 right now. Uh, we would like to have at least a million. We think that they may be able to find that through some creative accounting skills at the committee levels. Um, so we're, we're optimistic, um, but cautiously optimistic at that. Uh, the dam rehabilitation, the 15 million, it, we requested 50 at the last session, uh, almost 12 months ago. It didn't get anything in the governor's final budget that he signed at the special session. It was revisited uh, and the 15 million is now in the governor's budget that they signed at the special session that ended in September, I think, maybe October. I don't know, it was several weeks ago now. But um, I guess Kendall has that highlighted uh, because since it's already in the budget, we feel pretty confident that it'll remain there and we may be able to delete this item off of our white paper. Not that we're deleting the item per se, but just delete it off of our white paper. And the goal is to try to keep our uh, legislative agenda to a one pager as best we can. Um, Soil and Water Conservation Board representation uh, on occasion, the uh, administration tends to paint outside the lines over what the code says, what we believe the code says. They painted outside the lines and went with a, a, a different uh, a suggestion, a recommendation that this board had put forth to them. And uh, in consultation with Agribusiness Council and Virginia Farm Bureau, we feel like this is a code change that we can clarify. And um, Kendall really went to bat for us as executive director and uh, wrote a couple of letters to the Secretary of the Commonwealth. Didn't get a response initially. And then subsequently, after we um, made some contact with our friends in the General Assembly, we got a nice response that said that they did paint within the lines, but we strongly disagree with that. So with that, that's the legislative proposal that came forward. Um, I would, can I make a motion as committee chair or does that have to come from somebody on the board for this? Yeah, it can come from the committee chair. Okay, I would make a recommendation that we hold our legislative agenda uh, as is with the caveat that we can remove item number four 
And so that will be four um, issues that will go forward for recommendation to the membership this afternoon. Uh, Granville here, I would like to suck at that motion, Rick. Thank you, Granville. Are there any questions on any individual items that I might be able to go through? Uh, Ricky, this is Daphne. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, if this is uh, if this is removed, in other words, uh, the, the money that was passed in the special session is for what, when does it begin and end that that money would be in the, but in the state? Perhaps DCR can help me with this. I know I've been in touch with them. The governor's budget has been signed. This 15 million has been, has been reallocated. So at this time, I guess I look to DCR in terms of when that 15 million becomes able for use and implementation. I thought I had some DCR folks on the line. Um, Daphne, just to wait for DCR to come on. I, I'm not sure how that works. Um, a caveat to all of this is come January, there will be a push to reduce the 45 day session to a 30 day session. They may or may not revisit the budget. They may or may not amend the budget. Certainly they will have better numbers in January and into February. Um, if this money is once again retracted, redacted, however you want to say it, we certainly can um, we can always take the stand that it's in the governor's budget and has been signed and we strongly disagree with it being removed. But as far as when the funds are available. So I can actually sure. caveat that with the Soil and Water Board will meet on December 16th and we'll be making a motion on how to move forward with this funding since it has been signed by the governor. Fair enough. Okay, my, so my, my only concern is that there we certainly don't want a gap in the funding. Uh, for for this money. So I guess I call my soil and water board representative. That's, that's probably a good idea. But uh, <laughs> so we have um, a first and a second on putting forward this legislative agenda um, and removing the current dam rehabilitation number four. Do we have additional comments? on this legislative agenda and putting it forward. Nothing. Area two. Not to not to call you out, Jim. I just was curious if you had any Yes, yeah, well yeah we've had to, we had discussion about this last week and um, you know Area 2 wants to bring the healthy soils into this, but um, it really needs to be introduced in this afternoon's meeting. I don't think we can dispatch it right now. Okay. All right. Um, Thank yeah, you. I, I, will, I will introduce the healthy soils this after, in this afternoon's meeting and, see, and um, you know, we'll let it go out to everybody. And, you know, I've, I've informed them of what's going on with the, the limits on the um, number of bills the legislators can put forth and whatnot. But, um, um, you know, the most of the area too has, you know, the, the most of the directors have not been invited to this meeting. So, you know, we, we need to introduce this when, when they're there, when they're present. Okay, Jim, thanks for that update. I, I appreciate that. Georgina, this is uh, Daryl Glover for DCR. Uh, Hi, Daryl. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, am I going to have an opportunity to comment about this soil health, healthy soils proposal this afternoon, or should I make a comment now? I, if I can ask, let's wait to get through the legislative agenda because those are policy items too, unless we need to have the conversation and understand what the board recommendation is, even if we anticipate it this afternoon that Area 2 may ask to include it. Yeah, so I, I think what's Ken, what Kendall's suggesting is that 
Um, Daryl, we hold off on that discussion. We can briefly talk about it in the next bullet item, which is our policy book proposals. And then we probably will need to hear your comments again um, at the business meeting for the whole membership, specifically since uh, area two will be um, bringing it up at that point and it, it's gonna be valuable information for um, any decision making. So um, we can touch on it briefly in a few minutes and then um, I, I, I would ask you to probably reiterate that um, this afternoon. So let's just get through this legislative ag agenda um, and then we'll move forward with the policy book information. So again, the motion on the floor is to approve and move forward the legislative agenda with the with uh, the recommendation to remove the dam rehabilitation um, for this year um, because it's already uh, currently the 50 million is already in the budget. So any further discussion? All right, we're going to move to a vote. Again, all those in favor, please uh, signify uh, by checking yes in your participants box. Um, all those opposed, no. Let me get the participant box mm -hmm. up. I don't know. Give me a minute, I'll make sure it's just directly voting. Kendall's just doing a QA, QC to check on the members that voted. You have seven yes, one no, Stephen is three no. Okay. All right, majority carries the carries the vote. So motion is uh, passed. All right. Ricky, would you like to continue on to talk about the, the policy book review? Well, I will, if you want me to, or Kendall can take over. You have two policies that are brought forward. Um, one of them we briefly discussed about uh, supporting the Virginia Healthy Soils Program. There's a Virginia Healthy Soils Coalition that has just started meeting. Kendall is a member of that coalition um, and has been tasked with um, working on some of the policy and writing some of the language that will go in. It is a broad-based uh, initiative with NRCS and our many partners. So that's moving forward and that is, this recommendation goes into the uh, policy book and all of our policies get reviewed every three years, which this one will be a one year and it'll get reviewed again next December. Um, and Madam President, do you wanna do them one at a time or do you wanna do them both together? Yeah. One at a time? Yeah, one at a time, please. Um, well, then I would move that we accept the uh, establishment of the, uh, Healthy Soils Initiative in a, as a policy statement, as a recommendation to the uh, floor of the business meeting this afternoon. So Is moved. Is that Lynn? Yep. Sorry. <laughs> so Lynn Graves, second, Ricky Bash, the first on that. Again, the motion is to um, approve the policy statement as presented for recommendation to the full membership this afternoon for adoption. Um, I'll open it up to discussion. Tamina, this is actually appropriate if possible. If our DCR folks, if Daryl, you'd be happy to, to speak to this one. And if I can clarify and make sure, since not everyone was on our September board meeting, this was originally a legislative agenda item our board recommended to move into this policy statement. And that's what will be presented this afternoon. So thank you, Daryl and or Clyde. I knew you had some comments on this topic. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Kendall and Gianna. Um, there are a couple of things here I just want to raise for your consideration. Um, first, I mean, certainly supporting healthy soils is, um, you know, is, is a valid uh, thing that we want, all want to do. But I think, you know, within your policy statement, I think you really get to the heart of our point, which is in that upper box of item two. Much of what is going on within the VAX program is already promoting healthy soils. And, you know, the, the no-till, the, the nutrient management, uh, the, the residue, the cover crops, I mean, all of that, which we have been doing for many years. In addition to that, 
we have recently dedicated one of our staff persons to work with Virginia Tech, Rory McGuire, Virginia Tech, on their three-year research project for healthy soils. Part of the issue that no one seems to be able to answer yet, and we hope this research project can, is that no one can quantify the amount of benefit gained by any of these practices. We know that it helps healthy soils to some degree, uh, which helps carbon sequestration to some degree, but no one can quantify these things. What DCR is hoping to get out of participating in this research project is to come up with a soil health BMP bundle of the existing practices and possibly even new practices that we're not currently implementing in the VAX program. So I think overall that this is this premature if you want DCR to take some specific actions. And the other issue I would point out is item two in the bottom half of this statement, which is I really don't think that it's DCR's place to determine what other programs should be doing about healthy soils. I think what we first need to do from DCR's perspective is to figure out uh, what else we can do to promote healthy soils within our VAX programs and possibly our RMP program or maybe even other programs and then implement that and that that should be our focus and that, that is currently what our focus is with respect to healthy soils. Daryl, you raise a good point. I, I think that I hadn't, I hadn't really captured the shall as much as I, you know, the association can't dictate what DCR and DEQ sh should or must do. So I, we may need to think about how DCR feels about that statement there. Um, because unless this is something that your DCR and DEQ are already planning to do, then I, I do feel a little creepy about um, the shall then. Um. Well, let me hasten to add, I, I can, I'm not speaking for DEQ, only for DCR. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I don't know that Neil's on. Is Neil on? Who do we have? Anybody from DEQ on? Okay. I do appreciate that clarification, Daryl. Uh, any further discussion on this? Uh, this is Anne Marie. Yes, uh, Grand um, I just have a I question about the last line that we're currently seeing on the screen prior to the word adopted. Um, yeah, that phrase right there is there. Is there a verb missing from that? I'm not understanding fully what that the intention of that line is. Um, so I think this is language that came originally out of area two in our legislative agenda and our board recommended moving it into our policy book. Uh, part of their recommendation would be that we pursue at some point a bill to amend the code of Virginia, which this anchors where it would be in code relating to healthy soils. So if there's a reframe, I guess I understand the intent here, speaking in legislative terms, but I think this is also a direct ask to a legislators and certainly as Mr. Rash has commented, could be a tough ask in a year like our upcoming General Assembly session. But, but Amory, to get to your point, I think what is being said, if I understand this correctly, is that last bit, soil's best management practices, would be the, the new, the title, the subtitle of it. I think that that is basically, if I read it correctly, it's basically saying, adding in title 10.1 subtitle, um, I chapter number 10.4 relating to healthy soils and that new section would be titled soils best management practices. So maybe the answer there is to capitalize those for clarification or change that somehow. Is that not? Well, maybe, maybe there's a heading that I'm just not seeing on the screen, but it, it just, it's, there's no action in that sentence. And it's not a complete sentence. It just says a bill to amend Oh, I get you. I see what you're saying. Yeah. If I can, um, if I could interject, um, I used to serve on a regulatory board um, 
at the state level and that, that that's before it goes to LIS. Um, that's just saying the intent and, and kind of guiding them to where they're hoping that it would make sense in the state statutes to do the amendment. Um, and, and if I could say um, where it says to carry out the purposes of the program, um, I think it was Mr. Glover that was saying about the shall. Again, that that's language that would go into um, a statute rather than a policy book. Um, it looks like there's some wordsmithing that needs to be there and perhaps like um, it could be changed to um, the Soil and Water Conservation Board supports incentives, including education, technical assistance, um, and subject to um, available funding, financial assistance to implement management practices that contribute to healthy soils and will work with other agencies and, and programs um, to help be successful or something along those lines rather than statute, um, more intent rather than shall and, and, and those things. Uh, at least that was my takeaway from the, um, the meeting that we had that, that, that we wanted to convey support um, rather than dictate the statute. And um, so. Yeah, Frida, that's, I mean, Kendall and I are just kind of talking back and I, Emery, I see exactly what you're saying. I'm sorry, it's just being confusing. You're right. It's what are we, what is the association planning to state by this policy? And as it says at the top, it's basically the title of the proposed policy statement is support the establishment of so I believe the correction at the bottom would be to support a bill is the action verb that you're looking for. Is yes, that 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 was the question. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. I really appreciate um, your patience as we figure that out. So yeah. So uh, yeah. So Kendall has typed in there to support a bill. Um, and I, I'm trying to. I'm just trying to think. Um, I'm still, I don't know if anybody has any suggestions, uh, Kendall, maybe if you want to add to this about the DCR and DEQ shall piece or Daryl, I know you, I know you can't speak for DEQ, but what would DCR propose as a recommendation to that? I, I would suggest that really the upper half of this statement that the policy piece of it items one, two, and three, that's perfectly fine. But once you go into this, carry out the purposes of the program through legislation, that is the part that, that DCR really has, thinks is very premature. Uh, Granville Hill, may I speak at this time? Sure, Granville, sorry. I heard you speak up earlier. And, um, one okay, of the no problem. Go ahead. I, I fully support, support, support Daryl on this right here. Um, we need to study this for another year with the committee or whatever, and then it bring it forward because I am for healthy soils, been working on it all my life uh, to make soils healthier. But uh, we, so many things of our programs, even with our best management uh, programs, are not in the best uh, soil health uh, when it comes to our programs that we put out. Um, breaking down carbon um, in the soil, at least carbon se sequestration. Um, this way a lot of corn stalks with the new technology and the technology we use in planting, it shuts off individual rows, not to over spray, not over plant, these type things. Um, to make these mandatory, you're gonna drive a lot of people out of these programs quick that can't afford it, don't plant two and three thousand acres to justify this is expensive technology and so a lot of it like myself I have uh I have it done because I'm too small and um just like uh well I won't get into it It'll take too much time but we're putting the cart before the horse we need to work on this more before we bring this forward there's too many ifs and when it's just like but not limited to fertilizer application based on nutrient management plans you have things to change. These last two years have been horrible, wet, dry, wet, and different things here. It changes your plans. And if you have to follow direct by that nutrient management plan or go to a uh, state agency 
to ask permission to change because of weather, we're setting ourselves up for failure and people start pulling out of these programs. We've, we're getting so many more people to sign up, but they see this, they're gonna start questioning because we are educational and research and not a regulatory. And I'm afraid some of this is gonna start pushing more regulatory and we're gonna start losing people and be the first nail in the co coffin of what um, uh, soil and water has been pushing for all these years and what Daryl has supported in trying to get these programs out here. Um, he sees so many people coming in asking for different things to, uh, to enhance the programs. In fact, y'all were uninundated uh, this last year with over 100 proposals. And to try to work for these things, we need to work through these before we propose it to bring it forward. I think to make it a policy or a, a statement of any kind at this point. And I'll cut it off right there. Thank you. Well, so, so Granville, just so I understand, is your is your position that this should neither go into uh, a legislative agenda nor a policy statement at this time? At this time, I'm not against the uh, self, uh, healthy soils, but I am against all of these things coming up until it's fully studied, reviewed, and who is doing what and how we're working together because we were like Henny Penny, if you know the old story on that, uh, soil and water doing all these things. No one wanted to participate because it wasn't money involved. Now that we're getting more money to create these programs, all of a sudden, everybody wants their hands in the pie to help direct. Um, in RCS, they have, a lot of their programs that uh, Chris Lawrence is carrying out right, right now, he came to the soil and water and learned, and now they're being pushed out here in directives. And I support Chris and a lot of what he's doing. But until it became profitable for them and a bullet point for them to work and, um, and keep employees, hey, they really uh, wasn't involved. And a lot of these other agencies too. Now I see that, okay, let's come to the table. The bread has already been cooked. The, if I may clarify, um, I, I hear your concerns about like requiring people to do that or to change their methods and how that could really upend all the goodwill that's been created. I just want to point out that the wording here is not require, it's about promotion. It is about education. Um, and it's about intent, it, it, it's not, um, and I, I'm aware that a lot of research and work went into creating the upper three thing about promoting widespread use. And from what you said, um, Mr. Maitland, I don't think that you disagree with the intent of wanting to learn more about these methods and to promote them and to support farmers who want to take that path. Nowhere in there is the word require. Um, which I think is what you are concerned about. Well, if you participate in programs, it will be requirements. And just like uh, cover crop, everything here is green. We planted in early October before we even harvested the crop to get ahead. But it says you cannot put any nitrogen or anything under this crop. How do you build a root system if you don't have a certain amount a pot, of, I mean, a phosphate and um, nitrogen to get the root. Double sized root takes up twice as much, uh, or actually four times as much um, nutrients out of the soil to hold it rather than going in groundwater. When you can't do some of these things on certain soils, a lot of the people say, I'm not participating in the program. I want to get as much growth and all that early in the fall to use up that to put out a larger root system. Then, these programs says, and, and uh, for SLA, it says, you may not until March uh, 15th. Right there, that limits you from any nitrogen going on the ground if you want to use biosolids, if you want to use poultry manure to get it down in time. Nitrogen does not start activating in the spring until the soil temperatures get warm enough. It's a biological, not a mineral. A lot okay. of these things, they, we're behind and I don't want to go into too much detail, but that's, we need uh, agronomists and some soil people there on this and work through a lot of things before we start recommending in on this program. Granville, I really appreciate um, 
your input. I think that Ricky wants to step in and, and say something before I, I start talking. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, Janina. Um, to try to capture what's been said uh, between Granville and Daryl and Frida and some of the others, um, and, and Janina has hinted at that we don't want to box in DCR, DEQ. If, uh, if you look at your screen, Kendall has some gray area highlighted. If we uh, remove that language, um, would that make the uh, policy statement more palatable to everyone? I think it does the exact same thing and gets us to our end goal of supporting it. Um, it just takes some of the burdensome language out that's uh, given heartburn to some of our um, partners. Yeah, and then just I, I, I have another suggestion at the top with what Mr. Maitland was saying about referring to program because it says establish a joint program. Could that be wordsmith to say supports of Virginia Healthy Soils Initiative instead of program? Yeah, I think it's I think it's officially called the Virginia Healthy Soils Program, is that correct? Or, or, and I like initiative. Frida, you're kind of on the same line as I was making some notations as well. And I had I, I had uh, suggested to Kendall assist um, in establishing a joint Virginia Healthy Soils Program. But I like the idea of initiative. I think that that does seem to, um, make it a little bit more flexible because we don't know what that looks like yet because it is like Daryl and others said, it, it is very much in its infancy. So, um, my, and right now I'm, I'm getting a nod from Kendall that no, it has not been defined as a program yet. So I, I think my recommendation based on all the feedback that we've heard would be to clarify the policy statement by making an edit to the first line that says assist with establishing a joint Virginia Healthy Soils Initiative. And Kendall's gonna make these changes on your screen so that you can see the recommendation. So that's the first one. The second change is to remove the DCR DEQ um, kind of requirements as, as what they would do because frankly and now that I see that we really can't dictate what DCR and DEQ does so that's really probably not appropriate for a policy statement and then uh, lastly to change um, the final line at the bottom oh I oh we're going to remove that too to support a bill was that in your intention Ricky too uh or just at, the at this time, I don't think supporting a bill is where we need to go. Okay. Um, I really and truly think that the pausing this, talking about it, working on it with our partners for the next 12 months is, is the best plan forward. Let's not confuse our legislators with the um, COVID chokehold that we have on them right now. Okay. So then the recommendation is basically to solely go forward with the very first half of the policy statement with the uh, revisions and then um, delete the requirements for DCR and DEQ and delete the information about a new bill or supporting a bill. Um, and so again, the recommendation here would be to would be to push forward a revised version of the policy yeah, yeah. statement for um, discussion at the business meeting this afternoon. Again, this is only a one year policy. So within a year, we will have to review it. And hopefully by that time, we will have some additional information um, about where the Virginia Healthy Soils Initiative, thank you, Frida, um, is going. Um, that gives us oh. flexibility. If they create a bill that's in alignment with our policy statement that's there, then the different you know, districts and our legislative people can, can point to that. If they create if something that doesn't look like what we have in our policy statement, then we don't have to support it. it right, Frida, that's a really good point. 
Um, and, you know, we have heard from several directors and our partners about um, individuals that are currently um, working in support of the initiative. So we've got a lot of uh, coals in the fire here. So I, I think that this does allow us to, to be influential where we need to be, where it makes sense at this point in time. And again, this will be a good discussion for our business meeting this afternoon as well. Um, I'll open it up for any other individuals if they wanna add some information uh, uh, before we move to a vote. Uh, yes, uh, Sandra, Stewart, Sandra Stewart here. I'm sorry, I had to miss most of the, the, the discussion. Um, I'm very much in favor of this initiative. And I'm concerned that we, established since we it seems that we are not going to to do the uh, legislative part right now that we have a um, clear way forward of when we are going to meet and who's going to organize that um, at, at least i would appreciate that thank you yeah and i think we've had some of that discussion and i know that um regarding legislative agenda that area two i know mean, you probably you may have missed this part of the discussion area two intends to to bring this back up at the business meeting this afternoon for discussion so that the full membership can um understand where we are and again um this policy will be reintroduced this afternoon with these revisions um also um, for a point of discussion. So I, I do anticipate that we will be going into this further. And again, the reason it was initially pulled out of the legislative agenda is given the current uh, situation with the pandemic and the limitations on our legislator and the shortened General Assembly and just trying to put forth um, what we really feel and what we're hearing from folks is going to be the best approach. Um, and just that the fact that the Virginia Healthy Soils Initiative is just really too early um, in its development that there's it's hard to put there. And so that's why it was originally pulled um, in September from the agenda. Um, and I don't know if anybody want to add to that. Nope, Kendall doesn't and Ricky doesn't. So um, right now, I think we need to go ahead and, and move to a, a vote on this so we can get to the rest of our agenda. Um, again, uh, the, and I think that now would have to be an amendment to the motion um, to uh, include these revisions. And right, again, just a reminder, we had um, Ricky and... I support the amendment to my second. Thank you. For my second. Well, then. Yep. And Ricky's shaking. Lynn. Okay, Lynn. Thanks. All right. So we have a first uh, and a second for the policy statement as amended during our discussion um, and, and is presented by Kendall in track changes. Um, again, this would be going to the full membership uh, this afternoon with these recommended changes. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and move to a vote. And I'm just waiting for Kendall to save this and we'll pull the screen up. And again, all right, all of, all those in favor of um, approving policy statement as amended during this discussion and recommending it forward to this afternoon's business meeting signify by saying aye by clicking yes and no um, by clicking red. But, but only chairs and co-chairs can vote. Just, Dr. Chairs. Just chairs. Did the votes get reset? Because mine was still already checked, just out of curiosity. All right. If you can resubmit your vote right now. Yeah, and again, to, to Frida's point, um, the current vote right now is limited to your executive board and your area chairs. And for area... Five, who would we decide for that? Yeah. Daphne um, has the vote for area five. Is it the uh, temporarily appointed area chair there? Okay, so I see um, eight yeses, 
So the motion has carried. So this policy statement will um, be presented this afternoon. Thank you all for the discussion. I think this is really good discussion. Um, and I'm glad to see us all um, getting involved. Um, so the next, and I don't mind, Ricky, if you don't mind, I'll take the next one. Sure. Uh, um, <laughs> the next one is the association non-discrimination policy proposal to move forward to the membership this afternoon. Um, I strongly support this policy statement. Um, I would like to thank Jim uh, Gelson for his um, initial kind of kick in the pants on this. Um, this came out of an issue from the spring board meeting and I think that it's the right thing to do. Um, at all the area meetings, we've had great conversation about this issue. A lot of good input specifically in the paragraph highlighted by Kendall. So we had you know six area meetings and through each area meeting there was um, concerns expressed and um, thoughtful suggestions um, provided for improving this. And so here we are, this is the language that um, we compiled and came to after all the area meetings. So uh, we'll need a motion to carry this forward as presented to you now. Jim, I make the motion to present it forward. Thank you. So I've got a, a motion from Jim Gelson. This is Gary Boring, I'll second. Thank you, Gary. Second from Gary. All right, I'm opening it up for discussion. Is there any discussion um, on the policy statement as presented right now? All right, again, the motion is to um, accept this non-discrimination policy um, as being presented to you now for recommendation to the full membership this afternoon, afternoon for adoption. So here we go. All those in favor. Wait, wait, wait. Please, wait, wait, wait. What? Kendall needs to clear the votes again. Sorry. Thank you. I apologize. Thank you. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, that's fine, Stephen. I appreciate it. Trusting me. Getting ready for this afternoon. Keep I your toes. All right, here we go. All those in favor, please check yes in the participants box. All those opposed, please check no. Give everybody a few minutes. All right, I see eight yeses and no no's, so motion is carried. Thank you all. And again, I really do appreciate all the areas and their um thoughtful and constructive feedback on uh, both these policy statements um, to go forward this afternoon. I can round out your legislative agenda. Okay, so Kendall's gonna um, give us the last uh, two bullets here for us and then we'll move to John on federal updates. Thank you so much, President France. I'm sharing on your screen that website again. We talked about some of these sessions already, part of our training blitz. I really wanna hone in on two that I hope you will register for and put on your calendar today. January 6th, normally at an in-person annual conference, we have on Monday afternoon, an important partner panel. Folks like Director Paler, Director Chrisman, all join us to speak about how we can better work together, what efforts they're undergoing. This is still an important session and we've decided to push it into January this year intentionally because our speakers that are state agency directors can also now inform us about the budget. The governor will propose another budget on December 16th and can share with us not only updates on budget, but also their other work. We've also invited Dr. Edwin Martinez, the new state conservationist within RCS to speak. And we may be adding a NACD representative to this lineup. So please ensure you can join us January 6th, 10 to 1130 and come ready with lots of great questions for our panelists. On January 7th, really in line with legislative work. This is about a week before General Assembly kicks off. The first day of session is January 13th. We won't be able to have an in-person legislative day this year. January 7th will help make up for some of that. So if you have any interest in our legislative committee work, I would like you to join this January 7th one. Let us know at that time too, if you don't send me an email ahead of then, but you can put in the chat box, I'd like to be a part of the legislative committee on that day. We'll spend some time with Ricky and partners talking about the legislative process, how a bill becomes a law, the budget process, 
We'll talk about how we move our legislative agenda forward. And more importantly, we're really excited to have Delegate Ken Plum joining us to speak about legislative insights for the upcoming General Assembly session. So two really important sessions that I hope you put on your calendar and come ready with good questions. My final item, I think I just mentioned, General Assembly starts on January 13th without an in-person legislative day this year. I still wanna reiterate that it's extremely important that you connect with your legislators. Please invite them to your virtual meeting. If you are having a monthly board meeting virtually, what a great opportunity to have them pop in and give a few comments and still understand the work that's happening. We've found that a number of you have done that and there's been a new level of accessibility to getting them to some of these meetings. So keep those ideas in mind, share your annual report, your partner reports from area chairs are even more important now because when I virtually or email a legislator, I like to share those area reports so they have an idea of what's happening in their own area too. So please still continue to make those one-on-one -on -one contacts on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Kendall. Any questions about any of those? I do, like I say, encourage you to um, attend both those virtual training blitzes. I think they're uh, really important uh, sessions that unfortunately um, we weren't, aren't gonna have those in, in person this year. All right, John, is John on the line? Oh, there you are, John. Could you give us some federal updates? Oh, can't hear you, you're on, you're on mute, John. Goodness sakes, am I, am I now unmuted? You're good now, you're unmuted. Okay, I apologize. I think Kendall sent you out my written report, which was done on the 2nd of December. As you know, Congress is now back in town for a lame duck session. The only thing they really had to do was pass a bill preventing a government shutdown, another continuing resolution. And uh, our current continuing resolution expires on December 11th. So we'll see how they're going with that. That's a must do thing. But two other priority items for Congress are virus relief and defense policy. Virus relief now looks like they could actually pass something. It looks like both sides are getting together a little bit. On defense policy, when I wrote this note, they, uh, they had not passed a policy bill yet. And for 59 years in a row, they've always done that on a bipartisan basis. But as I talk to you today, they have finally passed a bill, a defense policy bill. Unfortunately, it doesn't contain something on, on, uh, that the president wanted in it. So there is a question now on whether or not he'll sign it. But at any rate, always fun here in Washington. The other thing that I think is important to note is that the Democrat Steering and Policy Committee had recommended Georgia, Republic, or Georgia Representative David Scott to be the, first chair, the next chairman of the House Ag Committee. And uh, he still has to be approved by the Democrat caucus, but they did that. So he will be, it uh, looks like the next chairman of the Ag Committee, House Ag Committee. And if so, he would be the first black chairman ever in our nation's history. Uh, the steering committee also recommended Representative Laura uh, Rosa DeLauro from, from Connecticut to be the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, another really key committee for us. I happen to know her and have worked with her. She's been a critic of USDA at times, but it's somebody we can work with. Most farm groups appear to be staying clear of whomever the president elect should choose as the next secretary of agriculture. Right now, if I had to predict, it looks like Representative uh, uh, Rosa, uh, excuse me, Representative Fudge, Marsha Fudge from Ohio is going to be the, the person that the, they pick. There have been some other people recommended, uh, named uh, as potentials, including Krista Hardin, who was a past uh, Deputy Secretary of Agriculture, and we all know because at one time she was the NACD CEO. But right now, I think if you were betting, Mar Marsha Fudge from Ohio looks to be the one that is likely to be selected. We've lost two heavyweights, really, for ag in this, this go around of elections and retirements. Pat Roberts, who's chaired the Senate Ag Committee for many, many years and is a good friend of mine, has chosen to retire. And Colin Peterson from Minnesota, who chaired the House Ag Committee, wasn't reelected. And both of those folks were personal friends of mine. I have worked with both of them for over 30 years. We're going to miss them both. Ag is going to miss them both. And I just hope that they can be replaced by people we can work with. That's probably enough. Thank you, John. Does anybody have any questions for John on any, our federal legislative update? All right, it's very uh, unpredictable future, I think, at this point. So hopefully, um, hopefully we'll do okay and we can work with some of those individuals. All right, Stephen, um, if you could please give us the NACD report. Stephen. 
Stephen was with us. You might be on mute. All right. There yeah. you go. I thought I cut it off. All right. Sorry. Um, please report that all 47 Virginia districts have paid their NACD dues. That's much appreciated. Um, so we will be recognized for 100% participation again um, at the, the coming uh, annual gathering. Um, as everybody knows, um, um, I, I think everybody knows at this point, the summer NACD board meeting and the Southeast Regional meeting were held virtually this year. Um, most of NACD's activities are being held virtually. Um, the uh, Southeast region still meets uh, virtually. Actually, we, the Southeast region has been been meeting even before virtual or Zoom component was introduced uh, by, by phone call, at least monthly for many, many years. And because of the uh, COVID this year, the pandemic, uh, many of the other regions across the uh, nation are also uh, doing it that way. And they have uh, basically copied the Southeast region. So uh, the Southeast continues to be a leader, just like Virginia continues to be a leader in conservation. Um, Let's see, so uh, for as far as participating for myself and John Peterson, we're still very active in, in all the uh, committees that Virginia is, is uh, uh, represents, has representation on. Um, so we, we uh, and along with Kendall, she sets in on the Southeast Regional meetings. Um, uh, sometimes uh, all three of us are also in the legislative meetings. And then I also participate in the uh, past presidents of, association um, meetings as well. Let's see, um, there will be a um, South uh, East Regional uh, meeting tomorrow at 7 p.m. If anybody is interested, um, you'll be hearing from um, our Southeast um, uh, NACD um, staff um, support person, Candace uh, Abernathy this afternoon but um, she has started doing a newsletter for the Southeast region. And uh, if anybody's interested in, in getting that, if they're not getting it already, please reach out to her this afternoon. Um, one of the things that she highlighted was um, um, the most recent edition of the NACD's The Resource uh, Magazine, the feature at the Neck for districts with Ken had her initially um, on, on the screen. So uh, kudos to them for, for making the addition of the resource. Um, let's see. Uh, the um, annual meeting for NACD has, has shifted totally to a virtual um, session uh, this year. Um, Kendall's highlighted dates. So uh, while well, Kendall mentioned earlier, she has taken a, a three-day meeting and, and, and squeeze it all down to, to one day. NACD is taking their annual meeting and stretch it out to 10 days, or 11 <laughs> days actually. So, um, which is gonna be quite a challenge, but the uh, first week is pretty much, I think, devoted to the business aspects of NACD activities. And the uh, second week is uh, uh, more the uh, uh, speaker section, the uh, updates, um, other uh, educational components uh, that NACD's annual meeting usually contains. Um, and the Southeast region will be meeting, I think on, what, uh, I think the 9th, February the 9th. But anyway, the, um, if anybody's interested in participating uh, in that annual meeting, which will be this is, which will be marking the 75th anniversary of NACD uh, and would have been held in New Orleans had we been able to do it um, that way. Uh, anyway, the cost is $50 registration fee. So it's a very nominal fee to participate in any portion or any um, section of NACD's annual meeting. Uh, you can look at the agenda. It's on the NACD's website. So if you have any interest in any aspect or the whole thing, if you want to set through all 10 days of it, uh, it's only $50 to participate. So uh, I think that pretty much covers everything I wanted to cover. Uh, John, if you have anything you want to add, please do so, or Kendall, likewise. The only thing I would add, Stephen, is that Virginia is also represented on NACD's Urban uh, Resource Policy yeah. Group. Uh, sorry, I had that on my list. I overlooked it. 
All right, great. Thank you, Stephen. All right, thank you. Anybody have any questions? All right, uh, we're going to move to the nominating committee report. Uh, again, elections will take place this afternoon at the business meeting. Um, John, could you uh, give us a, a quick report? I certainly will. Uh, the nominating committee this year consisted of Joan Commoner from the Lord Fairfax District, Gary Boring from the New River District, and myself. And this year we will elect this afternoon the following officers, the president for a one-year term, the first vice president for a one-year term, the second vice president for a one-year term, and the NACD board representative for a two-year term. And our, our treasurer, Don Wells, is not up for election this year. So following will be the nominating committee recommendations for officers. For the position of uh, N uh, State Association President, Giannina France from the Tri-County SWCD. For the position of First Vice President, Lynn Graves from Culpeper SWCD. For the position of Second Vice President, Wayne Davis from Colonial SWCD. And for the position of the NACD Board Representative, Stephen Meeks from the Thomas Jefferson and the SWCD. That will be the nominating committee report. Thank you, John. Does anybody have any questions? All right. I really appreciate you taking on that role, uh, John. All right, we're gonna move on now to our agency and partner reports. First up, we have the Virginia Association of Conservation District Employees. And I believe I saw Kelly Snotty's name on our list of participants here. Kelly, could you give, oh, there she is. Kelly, can you give yeah. us your report? Yes, ma'am, I can. Can you hear me all right? Yes, great, coming in loud and clear, thank you. So since we last gave you an update in September, the Employees Association has been partnering with the association, getting out our good virtual training opportunities. We are getting ready for our um, annual membership meeting tomorrow. We will have a Zoom meeting for that, for our employees luncheon. At that meeting, we will be doing elections for the positions of president, vice president, and representatives and alternates for areas two, four, and six. We will be handing out annual service awards, recognizing our employees for their years of service for um, years ranging from five to 35 years. We'll be recognizing 27 employees with that award. We will also be giving out the Outstanding Conservation District Professionals Award that we do every year. We have been working a lot this year with our new DEI committee to developing our statement of solidarity. We have been um, in discussion of what we're gonna do next year and how things are gonna proceed with the way the Employees Association is assisting and getting our trainings out and supporting our employees with their needs. We're working closely with DCR to make sure that we are supporting them and helping alongside the conservation planning program as well. The Southeast Conservation District Employees Association annual conference in Tennessee in November was canceled for the in-person meeting and changed to a one-day virtual session due to the cancellation of the mid-year meeting that we were supposed to host in March for that. We are rolling that over to next year. We'll see if we'll be able to host that again as well. Everything is in the planning stages and we'll move on from there. Um, at the November virtual meeting, I was inducted as the vice president for the Southeast Employees Association and I'll be representing us on that board as I rotate off tomorrow as the president for our Virginia board. Congratulations, and, Kelly. Thank you. So the, our Employees Association is very thankful for the support of the Education Foundation and the association and all the directors that allow their staff to be a part of our board. So we thank all the directors that are on here, allowing our staff to be representatives and voices for our association. Great, and I, and I see here that you have annual service awards tomorrow, recognizing 27 employees from the years of service from five to 35 years of service. So that's pretty spectacular. And I know, you know, previously, you know, we've recognized those folks at, you know, our final banquet and um this oh we're gonna do it this afternoon oh, and there'll be a slide and i i am planning to try to attend your your meeting tomorrow morning so see how like as long as nobody threw any work meetings on my calendar today when i'm not at work <laughs> we'll see how that goes um 
All right. Did you have anything else, Kelly? No, ma'am. I think that covered it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Again, I encourage everybody to, um, you don't have to be uh, an employee to be a member of the, the Association of Conservation District Employees. Um, please, you know, it's a, it's a great way to support um, our employees. And everybody knows, and I've said this at a couple of area meetings, if not all of them, um, how important staff is to me. And that um, without our district staff and our association staff, that we certainly wouldn't be as successful as we are. So um, thank you again, Kelly, for your leadership in that. And uh, good luck with the, the leadership as vice president of the Southeast region. All right, any questions? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna move on to our next report, which is from the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And I believe we were fortunate enough today to have Dr. Martinez on um, to give us his uh, report or an update on current issues. Dr. Martinez, are you still with us? Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Perfect, thank you for the opportunity. I'm glad to be here. Uh, a detailed NRCS report uh, was sent out. It has all details per a specific area from all my team members, but I'm just going to highlight a few uh, important items. One of them is that we are conducting a sign up for EQIP, CSB, and ASEP. Uh, the deadline for the EQIP program is December 18. We don't have a specific deadline for ASEP and CSB yet but that guidance will come out later and we will share that information. Uh, we will be allocating about $300,000 for conservation innovation grants funds for Virginia. And the primary focus of these funds will be um, a special emphasis on soil health. Uh, we will have additional information to share as well in the near future, but just wanted to let you know that that's ongoing right now. Um, we were able to participate in the Virginia State University Veterans Farmer Conference that was uh, hosted uh, two weeks ago or so. And uh, we provided updates and information regarding NRCS programs, uh, farm bill conservation programs and opportunities for veteran farmers. Other federal agencies were there, FSARD and others participated as well. Um, we're looking forward to working with the Soil and Water Conservation Districts to update the MOU uh, the funded cooperative agreements and contribution agreements uh, per field office. There is a draft internal standard operation procedure that I worked with my team last week to put together to have a plan to address this task in 2021. And additional information will be sent to the team members as well so that we can all work together as a team and, and successfully complete this task. Um, the other agreement or MOA that we have is a data sharing agreement. Uh, we made a lot of progress on this one working with DCR. We have drafted the letter that will go to the participants or to the landowners. We also drafted the authorization form and is being sent to the national office for review. The authorization form will be the one that the uh, landowners will use to provide authorization to partners to use their data. Um, in addition to that, we also finalize the internal process on how we're going to be uh, implementing this MOA within the state. So we're working back and forth with DCR to effectively have the strategic plan implemented for the MOA on data sharing. Uh, as you may have seen, there's a lot of different um, updates on the report that we sent, especially on farm bill programs. There's a detailed report per program, how many contracts, how much money, et cetera. Uh, and it's uh, ongoing efforts. And uh, other than that, I think unless there's any questions, I'm good to go. And I, once again, I really appreciate the partnership and the opportunity to join this morning. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. Does anybody have any questions? All right, great, thank you. All right, we're moving right along to our Virginia Cooperative Extension Report. Dan, are you on the phone? Are you on the phone with us? There you are, Dan. I am. Good morning, everybody. Nice to be here. Uh, there's, in the interest of time, I think I'll focus on two uh, specific items. One is that we have been working closely with SWCD staff uh, at the state level and in the local uh, districts and with our district directors and our agents 
to update the extension agent appointments uh, to the SWCD boards. So we have successfully worked through 47 of those. Um, I'm pleased to share that uh, every board will have an agent representative. I will mention that I happen to notice uh, in the form as we were updating it, that there were some that previ previously had been vacant. So if that situation arises, let's please have that conversation. And even if your county extension uh, office has an A&R agent vacancy uh, with some creativity in all likelihood, there's something that we can do to ensure agent representation on the SWCD board. Um, the other thing I mentioned, I'll mention is really, um, it's kind of a report on beha behalf of a broader group, but the uh, Virginia uh, Farmer Survey, if um, the survey that we've talked about in the past that's being done by the task force uh, pulled together by Deputy Secretary Jennings is uh, moving ahead and the committee's done a bang up job on a final draft of a survey that's currently being beta tested. That feedback will be coming back to us from, from 10 folks uh, nominated by Extension Soil and Water and Farm Bureau. Um, that'll be incorporated into the survey. Uh, the survey has been designed in Qualtrics by the Virginia Tech Office of Analytics and Institutional Effectiveness and they're doing a great job. And uh, so is the broader committee. They have really put a ton of time into making this um, be an efficient, um, easy to use survey for our agricultural producers. Uh, and we're looking forward to that survey coming out perhaps in early January. So more information on that forthcoming. But um, I'll go ahead and stop there with the BC report. Feel free to contact me anytime with questions. Thank you. And a huge thank you for all your work on that voluntary survey. I know we've served on the committee to help with it, but you have done the lion's share and taken lead on it. And I really do appreciate everything to make it happen. I know I just looked at Ricky. He's one of our beta testers who's working on it as we speak at the other end of the table. So thank you for everything you've done to make that happen. I look forward to trying to help message that further with our own districts. You're welcome. And thank you all. And thank you, Ricky, for taking a look at that and giving us some constructive feedback. All right, does anybody have any questions for Dan? All right, we're going to move, keep going forward here. Um, Virginia Department of Forestry, I believe that we have Matt Pro on the line. Is, is he with us? I'm here. Hey, how's it going, Matt? I'm doing good, thank you. Um, I didn't submit a formal report, but I do have some comments to make. Uh, the Department of Forestry had uh, Inspected 4,623 harvests last year for a total of 204, almost 205,000 acres. Uh, we did uh, 20,197 inspections on those 4,600 4, jobs. Um, we had 120 water quality actions, which is down significantly over the years from uh, probably a high of about 5, 000, uh, 500 actions. Uh, back a few years ago. Uh, 29 failure to notify violations, which is less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the total job. So we know pretty much where all the harvesting is occurring in the state. Um, 21 logger education classes with 604 participants. And some of those were in person before the pandemic struck. And some of those were virtual uh, since the pandemic uh, began. And uh, we're doing a lot of virtual training now and learning to adapt to this new world that we're living in. Um, uh, probably another, another significant uh, report was last month we closed on a new state forest in Charlotte County, uh, about 2,531 acres, known as the Charlotte State Forest. Uh, it's near Drake's Branch, part of the Stanley property, um, Stanley Land and, and Lumber Corporation property. Uh, which was owned in the past by Thomas Stanley, a uh, Commonwealth's 57th governor of the state. Uh, we've got an additional 2,500 acres in the pipeline for addition to that for uh, probably the, I guess it's gonna be about the fifth largest state forest that we have in the, in the Commonwealth. 
uh, and that, that'll be happening in the future, but we, did, we do have a new state forest in Charlotte County. Uh, the State Foresters Hardwood Initiative is moving forward despite the uh, budget reduction that we had to take uh, uh, that we were gonna use to uh, support that program, but we're moving ahead with it, training up some of our individuals, our, our field foresters with, with hardwood training, thanks to the Forest Service, uh, Coweta uh, Southern Research Station. Uh, they're helping us train up our some of our field foresters with the latest uh, hardwood management uh, practices. Um, let's see, we sent a bunch of state of our DOF employees and part-timers out west for supporting the wildfire situation out in the western states this year, um, as well as supporting our VDEM, uh, Virginia Department of Emergency Management, uh, with planning assistance, probably probably for about six months, uh, helping them plan this whole COVID response, uh, pandemic response that, that, the state, that the state has been taking on, um, you know, moving logistic, logistical stuff around, uh, supporting that effort. Um, we've added some grant funded riparian forest buffer specialists in the Northern Shenandoah Valley and the Northern Virginia area. Um, as well as working closely with the James River Association uh, on the Middle James River project where we're uh, implementing riparian forest buffers to support the Chesapeake Bay restoration effort. Uh, it's kind of a unique situation where we're, we're um, doing it in con uh, as a turnkey approach, uh, you know, where the landowners don't have to actually put out any kind of funding at all. Um, they, they just agree to us installing it and we arrange for the contractors and supply the trees and do all the work and that's all covered under the grant, um, thanks to the Virginia uh, Environmental Endowment. And that's all I have to report at this time. I'll... Thank you, Matt. Does anybody, else have, does anybody have any questions in forestry? All right, thank you for all your great work. And that's great to hear that you had, we had now have another uh, state forest. Um, again, it's, it's really difficult times and getting out there is, is challenging, but I'm glad to see work getting done. All right, we're moving on to our uh, VDAC, Virginia Department of Agricultural and Consumer Services. I believe we have Daryl Marshall on the line. Yeah, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, Daryl. All right. Yes. And in a uh, brief report, just kind of highlighting our activities uh, thus far for our program year, which goes from April 1 uh, to March 31st uh, each year. So since April 1 of 2020, we have received 38 official complaints. Uh, and you'll see the uh, the breakdown of, of uh, the complaints that we've received. That's that's about average for for where we are, you know, in the year. Uh, last year, we had a total of, of uh, 48 water quality complaints that, that we had responded to for the entire program year. So we're just 10 behind that. Um, that actually, things have been a little uh, crazy because of the pandemic. We've seen, you know, uh, upticks in the number of complaints coming in at times. And then, you know, at times we're, um, you know, not seeing many at all. And a lot of that's uh, in relation to the, uh, the weather we've had uh, lately as well. So. Um, but those are the breakdowns of the, uh, the water quality complaints that we had received. Um, and for the sake of time, I won't go through each one, but uh, the, the, the final uh, bullet on the, uh, the report there does highlight uh, something that, that we do take very seriously. It's, uh, we've um, issued three civil penalties uh, recently uh, involving, involving four separate uh, violations of a corrective order that we had uh, in a particular case. Um, and that's, those are the first penalties that, that our program has ever issued throughout the history of the program. So there's, like I said, that's something that we take very seriously, something that we, uh, we've never had to, uh, to take it that far until here recently. Um, but we, uh, we've had to do that and, and uh, we're hoping to, to resolve this as quickly as possible. But um, any questions about any of that or any of the, uh, the complaints or anything in the report, feel free to, uh, to to give me a shout and I'll see what I can do to, to explain everything. And that's all I have. 
All right. Does anybody have any questions for Daryl? All right. Thank you, Daryl, for your report. And now we'll get to the Virginia Soil and Water Conservation Board and DCR. And we have Clyde Christman online and, and Daryl Marshall. So we'll. Cool. Oh, sorry, Daryl. <laughs> Daryl Glover. <laughs> so I need, I'm ready for lunch, I think. <laughs> Go ahead. Janina, this is Clyde. I'll just jump on real quick. Uh, Daryl's got the meat of the report, but I just wanted to uh, jump on and say hi to everybody. I've uh, been enjoying uh, participating in the meeting here while I'm double and triple tasking on everything else we've got going on today. Um, and I know that uh, you guys did have a question about the, uh, the $15 million in the dam safety fund. Uh, those funds are in the process of being transferred over to the VRA. Um, and we do have a soil and water conservation board coming up on December 16th, um, where I'm sure we're going to be discussing uh, moving forward with those funds as well as a lot of other things. So I invite uh, all of you to join into that virtual meeting on December 16th. And with that, I'll turn it over to Daryl and let him uh, continue on with our report. And I'll be standing by for any questions. All right. Thank you, Clyde. Good morning again, everybody. Um, I'm going to skim through the report uh, that you see there that Kendall has uh, up on the screen. Um, ben Gerlich from Cooperative Extension already mentioned the farmer survey, the voluntary BMP survey. On the top of the second page, I want to call your attention to the fact that DCR is about to initiate another conservation tillage residue survey in the spring. Uh, we did that in 2015, 2016. This year, or this coming year, we're going to be doing it only in the Bay Watershed, um, which goes along with our source of funding, which is one of the Bay Grants. Uh, those affected districts will be notified as to uh, how much we can pay them to conduct this survey and also the schedule uh, that we need. For those of you who were around, it'll be very much like the last time we did it in 2015, 2016. We are also going to introduce a new Transect survey uh, next winter, which is going to be our first color crop survey. Uh, this will also only be in the Bay Watershed, uh, and again, will be funded uh, by a great grant. There'll be more details on that uh, in several months. Dr. Martinez from NRCS mentioned the data sharing agreement, <clears throat> so I'll bypass that as well and move on to a Chesapeake Bay Bill update at the bottom of page two, second half of page two. Couple of things there, the action items that are requirements that the department and our board has to, to do in accordance with that legislation are listed in the bullet points. Uh, with respect to the office methods for determining perennial streams, there is draft guidance that is out. The public comment period on that guidance closes Wednesday the 9th and the Soil Water Board will take up that guidance at their meeting next week, uh, as Clyde has mentioned. Also, uh, the Ag b, &B Technical Advisory Committee has recommended a portable livestock stream exclusion fencing BMP specification. That will be presented to the Soil and Water Conservation Board in March, along with the other TAC recommendations and the proposed FY22 Ag BMP manual. So that will follow the normal uh, program development cycle. Flipping over to page three. One of the new initiatives we're going to propose to help to implement the Bay Bill is the Small Herd Initiative, a little further down on the page. And what this is, if you haven't heard of it, uh, by looking at the data for the 100% Livestock Stream Exclusion Initiative that was conducted over several years, what we found is that there the average herd size that participated in that program and received funding was about 35 head of cattle. However, by looking at the, the Ag Census, we see that there's a considerable number of, of livestock operations uh, that have less than 50 head of cattle. And so what we're proposing is something to deal with the smaller operations that have at least 20 head per the Bay Bill, which is the floor that has to uh, comply with livestock stream exclusion if the, uh, if the Bay reduction targets are not met by 2025. And 35, which was our average in the 100% SL6 initiative that we've already conducted. 
So the way this would work if the Soil and Water Board approves it is that anyone who qualifies could receive up to $25,000 non-competitively, meaning it would not affect their other VAX annual caps, participant caps. Um, they could apply for if they have cover crops, they have other things, they could still apply for VAX through the regular channels. But this would be a one-time up to the $25,000 payment so that they could get a livestock stream exclusion established on their operation. Uh, for districts, mainly this is going to mean basically a site inspection to ensure uh, that participants are not trying to split their herds and that in fact they are the target audience that we are trying to reach. So what we're going to do at the upcoming board meeting is we're going to propose uh, that the board fund this initiative. It will be funded through unobligated cost share that has been returned to DCR through canceled practices or otherwise returned by districts to DCR. So this will not affect the current year's cost share allocation at all. These are only being funded through return funds. We are going to propose 13% technical assistance along with these funds. And you'll hear more about that at the board meeting next week. Uh, scrolling down to the bottom of page three, the Ag BNP Technical Advisory Committee, uh, because we could have very limited ability to to vote on anything other than the, uh, the portable livestock stream exclusion BMP. Uh, what we did is we've conducted subcommittee webinars so that we could run through all the suggestions received by our four tax subcommittees and uh, inform the subcommittees as to which ones the department is going to recommend go forward to a stormwater conservation board consideration and possible approval. We're going to have a full TAC webinar on the 17th, the day after the Stormwater Board meets on the 16th, at which time uh, you will hear basically all of the final recommendations from the department of all the suggestions received as to which ones we're proposing to go forward to the Stormwater Board with in the spring. Again, that would also be in March as part of the normal next year's uh, program development cycle. You will have two weeks from the 17th to submit any written comments. Uh, however, there will not be any discussion during the webinar of the proposals uh, other than uh, typed questions through, through chat, such as we're doing here today. And I think I'll stop there unless there are any questions. Thank you, Daryl. Oh, are there any other questions? Uh, I would like to add one, if you don't mind, to Daryl. Sure, Randall. Daryl, is this thing that if this is passed, uh, like Appomattox River, we need quite a bit of funding for core share for, for, uh, for BMP SLH. All right. If another uh, district has funds left over, we cannot apply to them and get the funds come over to us, or it just goes back to DCR to go to this li uh, livestock uh, exclusion? No, uh, Granville, you can still uh, request funds from another district that they can't use through the, the voluntary transfer process that we've had over the past several years. Uh, you can still do that at any time. In fact, we've already seen a handful of transfer requests already in the past couple of months. All right, thank you. By return funds, what I mean is if at the end of the fiscal year, funds have not yet been obligated, then we will be pulling back some of those funds as we do every year, and they would be used to fund uh, the Small Herd Initiative for the following year. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, any more questions for DCR? All right, thank you. All right, I don't believe we have any other partners in attendance. Um, this is your time to speak up if I miss someone. Oh, I just know, I see Russ is on the line, Russ Baxter. Uh, thanks for, for joining us today. Sorry, I've been in and out today, uh, just like Clyde, triple tasking, but uh, been listening in and that Clyde was correct about the question you all had about the dam safety. It, it is on the board agenda next week uh, to authorize us to expend those funds for district dams. Great, thank you, Russ. All right, so we're gonna roll through the rest of our agenda pretty quickly because we're um, trying to wrap this up by 1230. 
um, so we can get ready for the business meeting this afternoon. So next is our executive committee and executive director report. Um, Kendall's going to handle some of these and I'll take some of them. So uh, we'll go back and forth. But Kendall's going to give us a, a quick update on VCAP efforts. I'm going to keep it very brief. I hope many of you attended the VCAP training session that was done last Wednesday. If you didn't, the recording and materials are up on our website. Maura Christian led that training. Kevin assisted. They did a fantastic job. I hope you plug into it. We currently have a public comment period open. I hope you offer some thoughts, feedback to the VCAP program and any manual changes, suggestions you might have. Uh, certainly we can share some of that information this afternoon on the business meeting and perhaps more Kevin can put in the chat box where you can look to have public comments. I'm going to also add that for VCAP, we are on a wait list at this point. I still encourage districts to submit monthly their applications to the steering committee. We do have some DEQ funds that we're waiting to receive. So it will be noted that as long as you get your applications in on time, we can better move those applications that are in the wait log as soon as we get funding. So certainly we'll be moving that as a legislative agenda item also. Unless there are questions for VCAP, I'm going to stop there in the interest of time. Thank you, Kevin, for dropping some of that in the feedback. I see you putting the public feedback form for program year 2022. Use that link to offer any suggestions. Great. Any, any VCAP questions? All right. Great. Thanks, Kendall. I want to quickly review uh, the agenda for the business meeting this afternoon. Um, and highlight some um, just the key some key points. So uh, Kendall has on the screen here your the business meeting agenda starting at two o'clock. So we're going to try to run it and keep it within two and a half hours. Um, as you can see from this meeting, we are using all our time. So we'll try to be as concise and efficient as possible this afternoon. A uh, couple of items that we've already discussed to, to note, we will be running over um, and approving or adopting the legislative agenda. Um, we will also be uh, reviewing and putting forward for adoption the soil health policies and the non-discrimination policies as we discussed. Um, and so you've got the agenda. We also have nominations um, and election of officers towards the end. We will be trying to squeeze in a lot of the information that's normally um, presented and or awarded um, at our banquet, usually at um, our typical annual meeting. Um, and then again, we'll have our foundation uh, raffle drawing. And then finally, a moment of remembrance or reflection. Uh, next, I am going to toss it over to Kendall for a quick update um, on anything else that I haven't covered. Uh, training blitzes, I know she was going to say it. I will also say it again and reiterate that it, there are still several training blitzes coming up. Please register for those online. And then Kendall, I'm going to toss it back to you for any other updates. No other updates. Certainly a lot of work from your association staff and on foundation activities. If there are questions, please let me know. We're doing okay with time. So I will not provide updates on that and just move into our raffle drawing if okay. That's good. If I can get Lynn Graves, John Peterson, John Flannery, Daphne and Don Wells to come off mute. I'm gonna need your help in our raffle drawing. We had numbers one through 1005 in terms of raffle tickets sold. And since I reported during the foundation meeting, we have now made the goal we were hoping and have $5,025 in raffle sales. So thank you to all of you. And I'm gonna ask for a little bit of help from those five individuals in terms of pulling a number between one and 1,005. So first we're gonna pull for our Graves Mountain item. And I'm gonna ask Lynn Graves to give me a number between one and 1,005. 777. 777. I am not going to actually announce the winners at this point. You can head up to that door and turn left. There will be somebody there helping you put lunch aside. Sorry, guys. Thank you so much. Um, we will announce who the number is once we can regroup and pull from the Excel spreadsheet this afternoon. Next, John Peterson. We're going to pull a Hotel Roanoke stay 
overnight stay and breakfast as our foundation treasurer. I appreciate all your help. Can you give me a number for this? 526. 526. Mr. John Flannery, Loudon was so kind to help donate a Yeti cooler. Would you give me a number? Uh, 314. 314. Blue Ridge Soil and Water was kind enough to donate a barn quilt. Would Daphne Jameson give me a number? Number 43. 43. <laughs> and our last item, Don Wells, I hope you came off mute too. He helped put oh, us in contact. I didn't steal your number, did I, Don? <laughs> no, that's fine. He helped us come up with the contact with James River Equipment for the steel backpack blower that we'll be giving away. Will you give me a number, Don? 76. 76. Thank you so much, guys. Stay tuned for who those numbers are in our Excel spreadsheet when we announce it this afternoon. All right. President Chapin, that's all I have. Kendall, this is John. Yes, sir. Do we have to register again for this afternoon? That's a really great question. You do need to register for this <laughs> afternoon. If you have not received a separate Zoom link, then you need to head to our website. I'm gonna share that screen one more time, hopefully, to the virtual annual meeting training blitz page and actually register just like you did for this one. It is a separate Zoom link. There we go. On this page of our website, where I was showing you all the different trainings to register for. You registered for our quarterly board meeting here. You need to actually register for the business meeting at this link. It will send you the connection information as soon as you register. We will hop on a few minutes early so folks can get comfortable. The agenda and all the materials are posted right here on this website too for this afternoon. Uh, Kendall, I have a question. Um, is are these um, materials so that I could make a paper copy of any of them uh, for, by just, I mean, I couldn't figure out how to do it last night, but I'm not real computer literate, but so, should I be able to do that somehow? Absolutely. So if you click the agenda itself, it will open up a Word document and it will have links to all of these exact same items that are posted here. If you click any of these, for example, the legislative agenda is going to download on your computer as a Word document. Some of these might download as a PDF document, but you're welcome to print any of these materials if it's helpful. They have been set up so you can do that. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Kendall. Um, you know, I don't think we have any new business. I don't think there's anybody want to bring anything up at this point. If not, we'll just go into my final remarks, which is to remember to notify us of your spring area meetings as soon as you have that information. Um, and then we'll be sending details on the spring quarterly board meeting. Um, not quite sure what that looks like. We may still be in virtual format in the spring, um, but um, to be determined. Other than that, that's all I have. Um, and so we'll take a break and see you all back at two o'clock for our annual business meeting. Uh, again, don't forget to register for the business meeting um, online. All right, any anything else? Last questions, comments, concerns? All right, we'll adjourn the meeting now and see you all this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hey, uh...